We are back. Hello, with the hello. illustrious Tony Cox. Hello. <laughs> Hola, and, <¿qué> tal? <laughs> and Pure Seven Jacob. What up, everybody? <laughs> or How California you doing, Tony? Jacob. You want to buy some wheels, Jacob? <laughs> <laughs> they have all four <laughs> wheels. You guys have never met it. You're the first guest that Jacob doesn't know already. No, I think. because little um, little Gary went and <laughs> went and let me down there selling my own wheels. Geese. He's talking about geese. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Shout out to geese. Yeah. If you're watching. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for coming through, man. Thanks for having me. How you doing? Pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Um, today's Tuesday. Yes, so that is. means that yesterday was MDMA Mondays. Yes, it was. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, how, how did that go? Uh, <laughs> we skipped a few. <laughs> we skipped because of the last weekend. Uh, okay. Yeah. So you got to make up for that next Monday. Then. Yeah, next Monday we'll have a full Monday. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right on. Wait, can you explain, please? Because I. I uh, no, you, know, you explain. Um, there's a thing that I do on Instagram called MDMA Mondays, nice. <laughs> which I think I made up the, <laughs> the whatever you want to call it, hashtag, but I think a lot of people think every Monday I take MDMA, <laughs> so <laughs> it's not necessarily, it's more of the vibe, it's, it's more the of the vibe, vibe okay, of okay. the video, <laughs> whichever gets posted for that Monday. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Good stuff, man. That, <laughs> could, that could be bad. But <laughs> it sounds pretty fun. Yeah. So Jacob's from San Francisco, originally born and raised, Tenderloin. Okay. Um, you spent a lot of time there. Um, not born, but raised. Raised. Yeah. Yeah. So. Very young. So, so we all have that in common. We were all SF lokes. Yeah. You spent. How long were you in SF? Uh, I mean, I moved there in what was it? January of '96. And then I started going back and forth to New York. I mean, like, my stuff was there until 2015, but I really didn't live there after 2007. So it was kind of just like a, uh, like a... Like ten, 10 years yeah. I lived there. Mm -hmm. But I was in and out between New York and then and Spain mm -hmm. as well. I want to... So remember in, S in the SF days, we kind of had, like, beef. Did we? <laughs> <laughs> there was a Cold War beef. I don't yes, remember hear that. that. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear about this. Huh? I want to hear about this. Yeah, well, I mean, it wasn't like a real beef. Yeah. But not me and you personally. Oh, you're talking like about the the divide between the tribes. Yeah, the tribe divide. Yeah, before it was a global tribe. Yeah, before we grew up a little bit and matured, and we're like, hey, you know what? You're actually kind of cool. And you're like, hey, what? You know, you're well, not you, so bad either. You guys were the ones holding down the square. Well, that was the, the court. That was the thing, because yeah. we were so stuck in our ways, and we were like, we're the locals. And we're the SFOGs, and yes. like, who are these dudes coming into our? Oh, what was that term called? Which one? Wh what I was called at that time? A t T-Dog? T-Dog. <laughs> <laughs> I've never actually called you that. You did not call me that, but I remember the term. And I remember, you know, you probably don't know me because that was not my scene to go to the pier. Yeah. And then I missed Embarcadero, and mm. unfortunately. But, um, yeah, that term was uh, yeah. given to quite a few of us that came into your guys' land. So, yeah, so you guys wouldn't do Pier 7, but you guys, our paths would cross at Union Square. Cause yes, it would, because that was a place that was like, it was like the place that everyone wanted to be. Mm -hmm. It was like a real square. Like, Pier was like its own thing, but the Union Square vibe was like a real city vibe where it mm -hmm. had like transient people shopping and tourists and... That's where you want it to be. Mm -hmm. And that's where everyone kind of interfaced and had to actually kind of say hello. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I also remember, like, after the down, like, EMB, like, Pier, Pier 7, like, everybody would kind of make their way up market. Mm -hmm. And then it would just end up at Union Square or whatever, you know? I yeah. wasn't part of your generation of Union Square, but I was definitely, like, I messed around after. Yeah. Like, they yeah. rebuilt it and stuff. Because I feel like <clears throat> we would end up at Union Square around like five, six in the evening, maybe four or five, six. Yeah. And then w we would kind of like you guys, like you, Kenny Reed, 
Who else yeah. was your crew at that time? Like, Well, I mean, I was at the 1664 Grove Street house, which was the McGrath brothers, which was Dennis Dennis and Matt and Barker Barrett and Mark, Marcus Brown. But before I lived in there, I lived with Tobias Walker and Tom Horning on mm -hmm. Golden Gate and Steiner. Okay. Kenny was later crew, but like his crew, him, Sean, and Kyle were always at Union. Mm -hmm. Me and Kenny became friends probably around like 1997. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I would go there more in, in the evening. Mm -hmm. It was more of an evening yeah, vibe. Yeah, it was an evening vibe. It's like where it's you went up. after you skated all day, you go there and like drink a beer and like yeah. skate and smoke weed or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that was the vibe. <laughs> And then you can chill, <laughs> and there'll be, like, tourists walking by. So might, you might be able to, like, be like, hey, what's yeah. up to, like, one of the ladies or something? But Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but we would be, like, in our corner, and you guys would be over there, and then we'd kind of be like, yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, what up? But that was, it, was the, it, <laughs> like you know it was it was the same way in New York back uh -huh. in, I mean, even later, like, 2001, you had, like, Max Fish, and across the street from Max Fish was this place called Notions. Mm. But you had, like... The art crew, which was like DeGraw and Leo and Ben Cho. And then you had like the Supreme crew, which was like Alex and Gio and all those people. But then you had Aaron, who mm. was kind of like the, the person. Down, the downtown Don. The downtown Don, who kind of like morphed both mm. these worlds. Well, but that was Carl. That was Carl in that situation yes. in the SF. Because Carl was the ambassador. He was like down with everybody. He was kind of like the mayor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, in SF. Yeah, 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 SF. Yeah, he was like the yeah, Switzerland. Everyone loves Carl, them. man. <laughs> yeah. That should be, yeah. Exactly. But the funny thing is that I kind of tripped. Once we reunited in Spain, I was like, I think I'm more like these guys than I am like. Those, Those guys. guys. <laughs> <laughs> from your, from, from my, my, your upbringing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I was like, I'm more into like being artistic and traveling and like yeah. learning about, Just you know, like, not yeah. that my old school crew isn't, but yeah, like. Yeah. You know. No, but you were like a true city kid. Mm -hmm. You know, you were like grew up in an urban environment where you were exposed to so much. But like when you. I think when we all landed in Spain, that just like changed everything. Yeah. You know, that was like a whole different culture and lifestyle where they actually really did live and have culture mm -hmm. was not about money or fame or who you knew it was about living life and like sharing what everyone had mm -hmm. and when did you arrive in barcelona i mean i first went there in 2001 but then i moved there like in 2005 okay yeah i got there the first time in 2003 and then well i was supposed to go 2002 mm -hmm. But I didn't, and then the first time was 2003. Mm -hmm. It's funny, because our lives have kind of been on the same trajectory. I know. It's like <laughs> SF, Barcelona, New York. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I here know. we are. And here we are. <laughs> I feel like I just skipped. I just went to New York. <laughs> I still need to go to Barcelona. Don't worry, you still have time. Yeah, yeah, I still have time. <laughs> You're a little younger than us. Yeah. Well, you just do it on the on the reverse. I need to do it. <laughs> Yeah, and you even wrote, I wrote for ATM Click, and you wrote for ATM Click. Yeah. We were like that, the same that, person. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Was it ATM, like the boards that never broke? Oh, no, no those things no, broke. No, no, those are different. Oh, no, but those things broke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. John Fowler. Oh, <laughs> well, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, but you wrote for the original ATM Click. Which was yeah, which was like automatic. Was yeah, which was Mark Gonzalez and yeah. Ron Chapman. Yeah, well, yeah you I, there? I, I rode for it with Mario Rubicaba and Mike Manzuri mm. and Brian Gaberman and John Minor and Chip Van Ham and Kip Sumter. So when, because when Gons left that, then Mario Rubicaba took over that. Yeah, when Mark left ATM, that company was underneath John Falhi, which was New School and Alva. So it just sat there. I guess the mark what did 6040 start after that or was it before 60 that? 60 damn that's a great question. I did you write for 6040 too? I wrote for 6040. I believe 6040 was after that. I think it was after that. So that company got left and then Mario wrote for a new school and I knew Mario from his bands and traveling from mm -hmm. coming to Louisville. So I moved to California and then Mario had that company and then like put me and Chip on the company, and then that's how it kind of mm. started. But that was 19, 1994. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're old. Yeah. <laughs> so before we go into this, like, how's COVID, everything, you've been good? How's your mental state? You've, you've um, been in a good place? or Yeah. I mean, my life 
in the beginning, I didn't really think my life changed that much. Like I lived upstate for like eight years, mm -hmm. like in isolation already. And then COVID happened and then my life was the opposite. I became social from my work being in New York and everyone else like became isolated. So in the beginning, I didn't really think it affected me, but then around February it hit and it really truly did. Mm -hmm. I realized it was affecting my mental state. February of this year. February of this year, yeah. 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 Yeah, of course, because last February was. Yeah, yeah. Before. We skipped a year, so it's a bit <laughs> confusing with yeah, time. Yeah. yeah. So what? What? How were you feeling? You were just feeling a little down, or? Uh, we lost my friend Alana Gavin, who was yes. a big part of our community, mm -hmm. and like my sister. So that hit me in a hard way, and then I think just like the state of the world. Yeah. I mean, just the whole thing, the whole mm -hmm. vibe, you know, was mm -hmm. affecting me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's been a. It's been a weird one. It's know? been a ride, yeah. so yeah, for sure. But I mean, I feel I feel okay now, yeah. and everything feels everything is fine. I would say for now. That's good. And how about you? Yeah, I'm good, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> every day is different. <laughs> one day you're like life's great. The yeah, next day I mean, you're like, like life sucks. Yeah, I'm like <laughs> I'm like a wave. One minute I'm fine, the next yeah. minute I'm down. I'm yeah. high. I'm low. So exactly. right now I feel fine yeah. and content. Yeah. I've been thinking about that a lot, though. Like, a lot of people, like, don't really realize how, like, wounded we are mm. from this whole thing. That's true. Yes. Like, it's like somebody getting punched in the face and wanting to still fight. Like, mm -hmm. oh, like, I'm good, I'm good. Like, there's something wrong with you. Yeah. You just got punched in the head. You know what I mean? Like, so <laughs> no, it's, it's like... That's a really good analogy. I feel, it, like, it, I feel like that's how a lot of people feel. And I pe people close to me, they haven't been outside forever. And then all of a sudden I go outside with them and I notice little weird things about, mm. like, them. But they're like, no, no, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. No, you know? no, so, it, I really, truly think this is the actual pandemic now, what's happening after the last year, because we're going to see the way that everyone's, exactly. everyone's emotions and trauma out. works yeah. out, and a lot of people's jobs either benefit it or did not, so we're going to see where that goes. But mm -hmm. I think the real trauma of the pandemic is now. And yeah. I, think mm. for, I think for especially New York and New Yorkers, yeah. People that live here never really, you know, had to sit inside themselves and question who they are, mm. what they did, because their whole time they're out being, doing their jobs, they're being yeah. fabulous, and that was their identity. And all that got taken out, and now a lot of those people's lives changed. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and they're having to deal with it emotionally and financially. So it's, everyone's like, yeah, it's back, it's back. I'm like, visually it's back, but yeah. it's still way off. You know, mm -hmm. there's a big glitch still. Yeah. It's going to take some time. It's going to take some And it's time. not going back to what it was, or I don't think it's going to go back. I to hope it was. doesn't because we, we learn now. So yeah. it's like, hopefully it doesn't happen again, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, like. Hope not. This and has to be a huge learning experience. Yeah, you know. And people are being <laughs> sweet and nice. Everyone has kind of buried their egos. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, it's kind of like the same when 9-11 happened, but. Mm -hmm. Slowly things go back, but hopefully, like people continue to stay in this state of mind, you know, yeah. to treat each other as human beings. Word. No, that's good. It's yeah. good. Totally. So let's uh, go back to the beginning. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you grew up in Kentucky, right? Yep. I grew that? up in Louisville. Louisville. It was great. I mean, it was. Um, it was amazing. You know, we had our own little tribe of people and in our own little world, which we were a hard crew, mm -hmm. just as the EMB crew yeah, was. What was your crew called? Uh, RDSD. What did that? What did that mean? Red Devil Satan Dogs. <laughs> what? <laughs> Red Devil. I was, I was thinking like something like the Louisville Slugger or something. In Kentucky, no. you probably get arrested for that. What the RDSD? <laughs> no, you, you guys got are devil like, worshippers. No, no, yeah. no. <laughs> that's like, that sounds like a hard click. Yeah, yeah <laughs> it was. Like... It was a hard crew, but no, we were the the outcast or whatever you want to call it. We were the ones getting chased by mm. the, the by the police and the people. So mm. it was a. Uh, it was a very I good crew. I would imagine. Yeah. yeah totally. <laughs> there was only like six of us. I mean, in, in that crew. Uh -huh. but And you guys uh, all were skaters. We were all skaters, okay. yeah. Well, we, we were skaters, but we like merged with like the with the music scene, which like Louisville is, is very known for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how did you get into skateboarding initially in the first place? Um, I was staying at this girl Estelle Martin's house. Her parents used to let me sleep over 
at her house, this girl, she was... Well, how old were you? Uh, I was in the third grade, and she is in the fourth grade. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, like, 14, but well, third grade, that's like no. what? Like, I was... Eight? Uh, oh, no, sorry. Okay. I, was in the, I was in the fourth grade, that's and she was in the fifth ago. grade. So I was 10 or 11. Okay. And she was 11 or 12. So out front of her house was this guy, Larry Lusher, mm -hmm. and Troy Miller, and they were ollieing over manhole, co manhole covers. <laughs> Person holes. Person holes. <laughs> yeah, Okay. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so being the typical little kid, I was an annoying kid. Let me see your board. Let me see your board. So mm -hmm. they gave me their board, and within about 15 minutes, I learned how to ollie. Mm -hmm. And so then I just started begging my dad to buy me a skateboard. Wait, 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 wait. You learn how to ollie in 15 minutes? Yes. <laughs> Are you That's fucking really kidding me? I mean, station, me? Station, <laughs> stationary, I was like hitting the tail and yeah. going up, but it took about like 15 minutes. Dude, it took me years. <laughs> yeah, dude. I'm talking about like literally like no, it was probably like, three years. It yeah. was like... It took me a while. It was like seeing magic for the first time, other, other than watching Michael Jackson do mm -hmm. the moonwalk on TV. Oh, watching yeah, those guys skate cool in front of the house, I was like, Your it, mind I, was blown. I, I, was, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you learn how to ollie, then you were like, I need a skateboard, you got yes. one. Yes, so my dad got me a skateboard, and then I met Matthew Renee and Josh Sachs outside of the skate shop on, in Speed Avenue. The skate shop was called Pro Quality, mm -hmm. outside of Bardstown Road. And then that was it. And then it was on for however many years it was on for, like 25 years. Mm. What were your first <laughs> tricks that you were learning? Um, my ollie? Well, I mean, I couldn't ollie over manhole cut. I could only do stationary ollie. But the next thing was street ramps. They were jumping street ramps. Oh, okay. So I learned cool. how to do all the street ramp moves. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. I mean, it took a while. It took like two years to learn all of them. But like... I think the first one was just your basic like method. launch ramp, La quarter pipe, half pipes, launch ramp. There you go. Yeah, well, street it skating. took me a year to learn how to kick flip. How long did it take? You? That took forever. <laughs> I think I did a heel flip before I did a kick flip. <laughs> I feel like that's pretty common. Yeah. <laughs> the first, I, before I learned to kick flip, I learned the, the where you switch mm -hmm. the sex change. The kick flip sex change is the first way I can learn to kick flip. Yeah. So I never like could do it the right yeah. way, and then later yeah. on I figured it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's my so, brain. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it takes a while yeah. to figure out. It takes a minute. So, I mean, you kind of touched on it earlier, but I wanted to ask you, like, how was the backlash or, like, going to school with your skateboard at that time? Like, what? Oh, man. What kind of, like... I'll never, ever <laughs> forget. What were the kids? How did the kids well, treat you Well, I mean, guys? I was, like, considering my namesake, I was very quick with my tongue. You know <laughs> what I mean? Having to grow up with my last name. <laughs> but I'll... <laughs> oh, yeah. But... <laughs> But, oh, yeah, um, I forgot about that. They yeah. probably had a lot of jokes in the first oh, place. They did, yeah. but like they, they all got smashed quickly, you know. <laughs> but I'll never forget, <laughs> considering that we're sitting in the van studio, this girl, Sarah Hilke, who was mm -hmm. like the it, or the, the term didn't exist, but she had like the coach purse and the tree torns and the Blomped. case. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll never forget, like, I wore my vans to school, mm -hmm. and I thought they were so cool. They were like, bright blue with um, white stripe, and she's like, look at those Kmart specials. <laughs> wow. No, look at those blue light specials, because that was Kmart, and then I'm like, look at society now. <laughs> look, at every, look at everyone's feet and what they're wearing. <laughs> so it, like, it, it was fine, yeah. you know what I mean? Growing up, it was like, I was accepted, mm -hmm. but I was already on the inner circle mm -hmm. of like those kids before I started skating, because I played sports and mm -hmm. did all that stuff. And it's, yeah, it's it's crazy nowadays. I mean, when you're a kid, those kind of words hurt. Like It was, like, supposed yeah. to hurt, and then, like, it it did hurt, but mm -hmm. then I look back and I think it's, like, that was kind of genius, genius like, yeah. what, what she said, but then I'm, like, <laughs> where you the hell? You never forget it. Yeah, like, I, ne I never, obviously not. Yeah. <laughs> At my age now, I'm still uh, reciting it. <laughs> <laughs> so who was the local ripper, like, when you were young? Uh, the local ripper... I mean, the one we all looked up to was this guy, Jimmy Bell. Mm -hmm. He was, like, sponsored by Renale Trucks. Do, okay. you, do you remember what that was? It was, like, a really crazy um, truck company from the East Coast and Naked Skateboards, oh, which wow. was, like, those boards you used to buy and, like, 
cut out. They had those like big pieces of wood you could trace and oh, okay. cut your own shape. Wow. But Jimmy Bell, he was on, and Jason Brown, he he skated for Walker. But then uh, Jimmy was on commercials for this thing called Rallies. Mm -hmm. Do you know what Rallies is? Yeah, it's like a burger yeah. chain. So right? he's like him and Jason are like airing over cars doing methods. So. Those were our first rippers, but then like the real local rippers were like Tom Horning, Jason Newman, Matthew Brene, and mm. Josh Sachs. With Tom Horning, you guys ended up being on the same team later on, right? We we were on like the same wheel team, but mm. we ended up living together in California, and we lived with Tobias Walker. Mm -hmm. You remember Tobias? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember him. Yeah, young brother, dreads. Yeah, 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 yeah for sure. Yeah. So at some point in time, you're like, you know what? I'm getting out of here. I'm gonna like take my skateboard career seriously. I'm gonna go pro. I didn't really. I didn't really <laughs> have. No, I really. I didn't really have. I didn't really have that motive. <laughs> Basically, I had somewhere. My friend Chip Van Ham was like, "You can come live with me and my sister for free." Uh -huh. And that's like, a little different. In Encinitas. Yeah. No, in it was called La Mesa, California, oh, okay. which is like East San Diego next to El Cajon. Okay. So, but Tom, Tom and Jason Newman and this guy Jack Barnett lived across the street. So, I think I saved a thousand dollars, and I drove my Honda Civic alone. Uh, who? You you drove alone to the I did drive mm -hmm. alone out there. Mm -hmm. um, so I drove and I had enough money to like sleep on his floor for like uh, three months and then the whole thing happened with Wait, how much money does that cost to sleep on his floor? Oh, I got to live there for free. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> I had a thousand dollars to eat pocket yeah. to eat food. Which is a lot. Word, kind word, of. Word. It was it was a lot for, for, younger, for yeah. that time, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you're chilling. Like yeah. you don't you eat like crap. Now you spend like a thousand dollars in a weekend here. <laughs> exactly. In New York. <laughs> exactly. So how did you end up in SF then? Like I ended up in SF because uh Jason Jason and Josh had moved to the Tenderloin and during high school I went up there to visit them, or after I went up there to visit them and just was like, this is where, oh no, how I written no, up, sorry, let me rewind. I went to the contest in Canada, mm -hmm. the, what was that called? A Slam City Jam? Slam City Jam. So on the way back from San, Slam City Jam, me and Mike Manziri and Kip stopped at Chris Sin's house in the Avenues. Okay. And I had never been to the Avenues. So we stayed with Chris and Anakin out there and I was like, I want to move here. This is where I want to live. I want to mm -hmm. live in the avenues. I want to be by the beach and the ocean, skate all this terrain. So then me and Tom went up there and Tobias to find a place to live. And of course, at that time, we had no credit. And like getting a house in the avenues was like a three bedroom house was $1,200. And you're like, whoa. We're like, whoa. <laughs> so nobody, nobody was going to give us, um, you know, nobody was going to give us a lease without yeah. any credit. So the last day before we were going to leave, we were at, Tobias is at Union Square, and he's trying to sell wheels to some kid. <laughs> and he goes back. And no, this is an insane story. So okay. he goes back to Union Square to sell this kid wheels for $15. And this, he's like, well, we're leaving tomorrow. We couldn't find a place. And he's like, I know these people that have this house on Golden Gate, and they need someone to take the basement. Okay. So oh, score. they introduced us to the house above. So me, Tom, and Tobias, we ended up moving into the basement on this thing, Golden Gate. And so we ended up there. How much was the rent there? It was, all, I, I mean, we all lived in one room. We paid each $227 each. So <laughs> <laughs> whatever that is times three, what is that, like $800 or yeah, almost 800 like bucks? That. Yeah, so, and then so Carl actually. and them were up the street on Fell Street. Yes, they were. Yeah, yeah. Like oh, yeah. up and around the <laughs> yeah. corner. If you walked up, wow. um, what was it? Fuck, it's been so long. McAllister, mm -hmm. you saw like the Olsen twins' house or yeah. whatever, <laughs> <laughs> or, or the yeah, the, the painted ladies, the right. painted yeah. ladies, and then Carl and them were over there. Uh -huh. But that's back when where they lived. That was like. The, that neighborhood was so kind of crazy. Yeah, yeah, it, it was, was next rough. to Buchanan. It was yeah. it was next to Hayes Valley. Hayes yeah. Valley. yeah, yeah, yeah. But the huff, the huff, the Hayes Valley Huff was right there. Huff yeah. Store was there. Yeah, it used yeah, to be pretty like, gnarly. That, that when was way, drop, that was way later. Sometime. I mean, I remember going to the liquor store. Was like, 
Yeah. Yeah. You're like, who's going? And it would be like, <laughs> ah. <laughs> walk or, walk or <laughs> yeah, skate. Yeah, like straight in. Yeah. Don't look at anybody. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the 90s were rough. Yeah. The, they were. <laughs> San Francisco was scary. Hell yeah. 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 Really scary. I yeah. think that's one of the reasons why I liked Spain so much, because I was like, I don't, I don't have to worry about anything. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. you would rock. The only place that late, late at night was the Raval, when you would walk through, like, where that big cat yeah, is. Yeah. I forget that plaza's name, but you walk up that one main strip to get to Las Ramblas, but mm. it was fine, yeah. you know? Everyone was like... I was like, nobody wants to shoot me here. No. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, had knives, they had knives, not guns. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah, pe- people are plotting. Yeah. yeah. A lot of hungry people. Mm-hmm. People are hungry, man. So when you get to SF, I mean, what is your, is it something that you had heard about? The culture in SF is obviously drastically different than the culture in Louisville. Yeah. I mean, was that something that attracted you? I mean. Yeah, I mean, what attracted me to there was, uh, other than skating, was the arts. I Mm -hmm. wanted to go there and, like, make paintings and take photos and skate. And I just liked it because it's like I never really lived in an urban environment. Mm -hmm. And. I liked the scene at the time because it was like, I mean, it seemed like the place to be still. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was like an, probably an end of an era for you since you grew up there, but I was into all that. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool, yeah. And as like, you're, you're a gay man, did that, did that like, at no, the time, was that something that had anything to do no, with it? No, at that time, that had nothing to do with it. Okay. N- nothing to do with my sexuality wanting mm-hmm. to be there. But later, later, yes. Mm-hmm. More so Barcelona. Okay. That, yeah. That's cool. And then how, when did you meet, like, Kenny Reed and all those dudes? I met Kenny, I mean, I remember the first time I probably saw Kenny was 96 or 97 at that demo, the thing in, uh, not Albany, but Berkeley. Mm -hmm. What was that thing? They used to do that Berkeley jam? I don't know. It was like a, I don't know. Was it like a Carl thing? No, it was like a demo thing where they always like blocked off the road and. Was it in the tennis court or no? No, it was like on a street, like right by Amoeba Records. Mm-hmm. But that was the first time, and then me and Kenny became friends around like '97. Skated a little bit, but then we really became really good friends when we both started skating for iPath. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. It's cool. Yeah iPath, that was a shit. I wanna, I wanna get into the whole iPath yeah. thing. iPath is the <laughs> shit, man. I think these people need to like retro those and yeah. just start work, rocking those and stuff. <laughs> we kind of touched a little bit on it earlier, because like how we would cross paths at Union Square. But like, I know our daily routine was like wake up, go to Pier Seven, go to like, you know, try to shoot a photo downtown, and then yeah. go to Union Square. Yeah. So like, what was like your your like, what was your daily routine? My in those daily days? routine? Oh my God, dude, are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> so different. It was like, ours was I the mean, same it, it every so, day. It sounds so Just corny. Wake up, r- write in my journal, <laughs> <laughs> go to um, Masonic. Was it Masonic? Mas- well, once a month, go to Masonic and uh, what was it called? Hate Street, get my food stamps. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I just like all these skater kids think it was like Masonic so fabulous. Yeah. So they think it was so fabulous, but they really knew, didn't really know what people were doing to uh-huh. sacrifice and do and skate and just like live that life. Yeah. You know, but do that. Go to um, Rainbow Grocery, buy my oh, yeah. bulk food. Was that on Fillmore? And the... it was on. It was down in the Mission. I'm spacing oh, okay. the streets, but that one's like right, like at the beginning of Mission, like maybe 14th. Yes. Yeah, exactly. like 13th, 14th in Mission. Yeah. Buy all my bulk food for the month. I was vegetarian at the time. And then I started drinking coffee. So like, right in my journal, mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's the same thing for like many years. Went skating. Had soy milk, <laughs> had coffee, <laughs> went skating, <laughs> smoked, <laughs> smoked weed, <laughs> went skating. So there wasn't a fi- spot fi- filmed that you guys, a trick. <laughs> there wasn't filmed a spot a that you guys all met up at every day or anything. No, okay, not we weren't like we didn't have like a religious discipline like you guys did, where yeah. it was like either the pier or union. Mm. And Barcadero was gone at that point, right? In 90, yeah. 96. they refurbished it, and then as soon as it was like skate, skate, skate knob yeah they just knobbed it yeah so so i started drinking coffee in 96 mm-hmm. so i'd go to cafe a beer this place on divisadero and fell basically get like high is mm-hmm. basically getting high for the first time <laughs> off caffeine come home if those guys weren't awake get them up get them out 
and go skate and then come back, make food, and then like repeat and then lis listen to records. At night, we would like smoke weed and listen to like the Palace Brothers mm -hmm. or all this music from like Chicago. Oh, that sounds great. That's chill. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like your routine was like a little healthier than ours. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a lot healthier than mine is at this point. Yeah. You might have thought about it a little bit more. We just kind of more. No, I think it, on, just, on it just feelings. happened. Like, we just had our own little zone. And I don't know. I can't believe I look back and now, like, living in a room with two people, basically, like, not even the height of these ceilings, but like this distance and this width, like, it just seems so crazy. Mm -hmm. And like we tolerate, tolerated one another. I'm, sh I'm sure I drove them insane and like vice versa, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I was 20, 21, 20 years old. <laughs> <laughs> so was anybody actually a dick to you from like the EMB crew? The only person that really ever like gave me like a hard time was little geese <laughs> Gary Gee because I was trying to sell sell wheels it's always wheels it's always it's, everybody's because trying I was to trying sell to wheels. sell like sell <laughs> stuff so I could sur survive and like you know it's like no difference than really being a drug dealer I was about to say you can't sell on our turf yeah it's, it's basically <laughs> like being a dealer like an like an art dealer or like a model dealer or whatever it's like yeah. yo you can't come up here and try to sell the same thing that we're selling and basically he tried to check me and I was like yo, fuck you man like, like those I, sales I need 15 it. bucks yeah <laughs> <laughs> Which yeah. wouldn't even last like ten minutes in like New York or San Francisco. I mean, to get you now. a burrito and like a forty or a beer. And, like, I didn't down, even. Man, yeah, yeah, but it would it would last me like three days. I would go, I would go buy groceries. Yeah. <laughs> I know. There's, there's a I wish I still had that mentality of the dollar. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because I look back and realize like when you got fifteen dollars, you're like, okay, now this has got to last. As opposed to is it just being disposable? Yeah. As, yeah. Of, as of now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's good to try to reset yourself and put your mind back where like stuff really mattered more. You know, yeah. It's just not like oh, buy I was the just money. trying to survive buy and this, eat. Buy that, and, you know? yeah. and like the other stuff we didn't really have to pay for. We had like skateboards to trade for like marijuana or, oh, or yeah. whatever. <laughs> but no one else really out of the EMB crew. They were all super like sweet, mm -hmm. like they're nice. But I didn't really engage much. You know. Yeah. I kind of like stayed in the West End Edition. And like out in the avenues. Mm -hmm. It's great because it's funny because San Francisco has so many great skate spots and yeah. we just skated the pier every day. Yeah. Like you, you, you guys were, you guys were all, we took it for no, granted. We took it for granted. No, I know, sure. but that was like, that was like the thing, same thing as like when we lived in Barcelona and, and you did take advantage. It's like we all had the, the Makba to like mm -hmm. convene and hang out at and like meet up, but then you would like travel outside and then you would like see. You know, mm -hmm. all those other things. Like Sans, like I never really went to Sans. Yeah, I spent way too much time at Sans. I mean, Sans <laughs> was, yeah, I went there that one, like, I think I went to Sans three times. Mm -hmm. And once was to meet Kenny and Paul and Jack Curtin and all those kids. Yeah. Like, shout and, out Jack. Yeah, you do know Jack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah for sure. Um, I know we kind of talked about it back backstage a little bit, but like, um, you know, uh, now it's a, in skateboarding, there's like a lot of, you know, it's, there's LGBTQ and all, yeah. all these things going on. So at that time, were you feeling comfortable with who you were, like within the skate world? I mean, when I lived or in Barcelona, yeah, when I was living in Barcelona is like when I really kind of came out, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I never really publicly announced I came out of the closet, but like the industry knew we would be at clubs and like the skate kids would see me making out with the dude. But, like, at the same time, I had, like, a girlfriend in Spain and, like, a boyfriend back home. <laughs> Player. <laughs> no, I mean, like, it, was, it wasn't, like, it was not, it was not meant to, I mean, it wouldn't say my boyfriend, but it was, like, someone that was, like, you know, was, like, a, I was a rolling stone. <laughs> and yeah, he, no he, he was, like, a shelter, like, you know, he, he was there for me. But mm. I was so young, and then that whole thing. But anything when everyone like kind of like learned about it, like I actually felt more protected. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I always thought of like skateboarding from my gen I'm not going to equate times of now, but like I equated skateboarding and the gay community very similar mm -hmm. because it was like a tribe of people 
that like always had your back and no matter like you met someone skating or you met someone at a gay bar and then all of a sudden you could travel to Seattle and stay with them and mm -hmm. sleep on the floor of their couch, you know? Mm -hmm. It was like a real community. Like yeah. they really, they like coincided with one another. Now I'm a little disconnected and I know there's a whole new scene in the community with, with all that. So I'm not really sure mm -hmm. how that is. But back then I didn't really feel like there was any homophobia yeah. or anything, you know? I felt like people were very supportive. Yeah. Like, there was only like, well, supposedly there was only a hand, handful of us, but I'm sure there were more. Mm -hmm. But like instant, like Jake Phelps, like my friend Heather Rose, she lived with him. He always knew, you know what I mean? Yeah. But like he protected me. Mm -hmm. He didn't like out me or anything. He just always made sure that I was like protected and taken care of. And same with like Ted Newsom at Trans World. It was like, it was awesome. Mm -hmm. And it made me feel better once I like let everyone know on the team and like, just was like a relief, you know? Yeah. You didn't have to live a double life anymore. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's something, some people say that, you know, skateboarding is a boys club that's kind of macho and jockish. But, you know, I've never, I not, I, I think there's elements of it that are, but like in San Francisco, I feel like everybody's fairly open-minded. No, they're like, fair. Yeah. I mean, they, they are. People, they, sorry, go ahead. No, they are open-minded. Mm -hmm. At least from my time there, they were very open-minded. I mean, you grew up in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. You know, you grew up in, like, the mecca of, of gay world and yeah. HIV. Like, you've seen all this stuff go down, so... Yeah, my mom was a social worker in the Tenderloin. Like, yeah. I've seen so it So there you go. You've seen it all. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how, with the younger generation... What you call Gen Z? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. You know, I, I'm a, a bit, I mean, I, I'm just going to be honest. I'm a bit disconnected. So I don't know their view on it. But mm -hmm. for me, it was very positive and yeah. supportive. And mm -hmm. so, so much love to all those people that just, like, never gave me a hard time about that. Yeah. Um, definitely, like, I never, personally, I never experienced any, there's obviously a lot of skaters that say dumb stuff and, like, ignorance <laughs> stuff and yes. use words that they shouldn't use but like we all use true those. homophobia i never experienced it no. in skateboarding no yeah. way no way man yeah. I, me either yeah and all those terms and all those words and we don't have to like say what they are but that was just a part of that time and of of the culture mm -hmm. and it wasn't Necessarily, yes, if people said those things, it necessarily wasn't meant, you know, yeah. it's just kind of like, I'm not going to say out of ignorance, but they're, they're just saying them to say them. They didn't really truly mean them. Yeah. So, and I guarantee you, like, nobody's saying that stuff anymore. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, no one's using those terms. Mm -hmm. But there was that, there was that one instance, what was, there was a skater who came out and he got, you were saying he got kicked off of Birdhouse or something? Yeah, like that? that was, uh, if I'm rem remembering right, I believe it was Tim Tim Von Vern, who mm. I believe was from Florida, and I think he did see some, you know, s some backlash. after, yeah, some backlash yeah. from mm -hmm. that. Yeah, which is harsh. Yeah, I think that was because of Jeremy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the thing is, it's like with skateboarding, there's so many different types of skaters. Like, yeah. people will classify skaters like, oh, you're a skater, but it's like you're you can be like a and thug that's the, skater, and that, and that's yeah. a jock skater. Yeah, but that's the same. Type. That's the same as gay men. Yeah. And it's like, and I always said this because everyone's like, you're a little bitch, you're a snob, and it's like, yeah, just because we skate doesn't necessarily mean we're gonna get along. And it's mm. the same for being. Um, a gay man or, or a gay woman, it's like, yeah, just because we're gay doesn't necessarily we're going to get along. You have, yeah. like, the basic bitch gay, you know, <laughs> who's, like, a basic bitch gay. You have the gym gay. Yeah. You have the art gay. You yeah. have the fashion gay. You have the hip-hop gay. Yeah. Teach us. Teach us. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. it's so everybody wants to lump everybody into groups well, and categories these yeah. days. But, but it's, 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 it's far further more than that. Mm -hmm. There's more of an expansive thing than just being one title, mm -hmm. you know? Totally. What, what I feel like like skateboarders back in the day also too, like it was more of just like a rare thing to be a skateboarder. So everyone's like, oh, you skate? You're down with the cause too, you mm -hmm. know? Like I'm gonna like yeah. come kick it with me. But now there's so many like random skaters and people, so many different types. It's just like, oh, well, uh, nah. You yeah, know? But, where, but where I grew up, like we were called skater faggots. Mm. Oof. I mean, it was, it was, yeah. a, it was a common thing, and like you would be skating, and well, I mean, 
It doesn't necessarily mean you were a faggot. They would call you that or yell you that? They would just drive by. They would say that to anybody. They would say that to anybody. Just because you're a skater. No, no, not not saying me. I mean, it was a it was a term like skaters were freaks. They They were were, they were alternative. Super low. So people would drive by the parking lot you're skating and just scream, scream that. Yeah. So just be like. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> like, are you? Are you? Oh, are you yeah. Yeah. Great. <laughs> but that, yeah. I highly doubt that's oh, happening yeah. in the middle of Kentucky or Milwaukee or Michigan or wherever. I don't think people are doing drive-bys with people screaming out the window of that anymore. Yeah, They're like, maybe. I, don't know. Uh, I, I don't, I don't think so because skating is so mainstream yeah. skating now. Skating is mainstream. It's so mainstream. Now they're like, do a kickflip. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Bro, do a heel flip. Yeah. Just yeah. they feel yeah. proud because they know. Like, they they the actually know like a, like they know a language, yeah. like a term of the language. I feel like nowadays the they'll be like, let me see that. Yeah. And actually like try the board. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, that, oh, that's me that's me when I'm drinking. Yeah. Let me see that, and yeah. they're like. <laughs> like wait what? Wait really? There's a random <laughs> drunk guy that walked by me. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, that's funny. So in S- you're in SF. Who are you? When who were you writing for at this time? Like how did in, things start taking off? Oh, right? when it when when I got to San Francisco. So when I got to San Francisco, I quit automatic teller machine. I quit ATM, and then I was hanging out with Gabe Morfert and Greg Hunt. Okay. And then love Greg w- Hunt. Yes, me too. And, and I Gabe love Morfitt. and I love Gabe too. So within like within six months of being there, I'm skating with them and I get the cover of Slap magazine. Doing what what did you do? I was I was doing Shout an, out to Slap. I was yeah. doing an Ollie over a bump. It's so funny if you think about this terminology, bump to bar. <laughs> like I did a bump at the bar. Yeah. <laughs> I was doing an Ollie <laughs> over the bump to bar and I've like never some, thought about it like yeah, that before. Right? <laughs> in some schoolyard way out near the airport that Gabe took us to and I was with Matt Field, who started uh, iPath. So uh, on my birthday, Gabe not on my yeah it was on my birthday gabe and uh greg we went camping like i I can't remember where and then they like we came back and then they handed me the magazine and i'd had the the cover of slap so Mm -hmm. from there i was getting boards from stereo and deluxe and they did that whole thing where so that kind of like enhanced your yeah that enhanced that enhanced my status and then like (laughs) Then I got thrown between all these people. I was going to, like, skate for them, Foundation, and I made this Sponsor Me video Mm -hmm. skating to, like, this song where they're, like, playing bottles Mm -hmm. and, like, like beats on bottles Mm -hmm. and doing all these tricks on walls and wallies before that thing was a thing. You were kind of doing that. Yeah, Yeah, you were, like, ahead of your – it's true. You were ahead of your time with all of that. I mean, should I ride for Supreme now if I dyed my hair blonde again? I think you could actually ride for Supreme, like, right now. (laughs) Like, just doing whatever it is that you do. Whatever it is I do. (laughs) Like, literally. Just let it be known. Yeah. Strobeck. Anyways, they... So, it all... None of that happened. I didn't get on Foundation. I didn't get on Deluxe. So, uh, when I first went to Europe, I was with Ricky Oyola. Mm -hmm. And that's the first time we took shrooms. Okay. So I had this really big bond with Ricky in Amsterdam, and then Matt Reason and Serge Chernowski came out to SF. We all took shrooms and went skating, and Ricky started, um, what was before Silver Star? It was out of New York. It was the... Um, Silver Star, that was a truck company? No, it was a board company, uh. but then there was the other one that was like based off like the Mason thing. Uh, uh. I'm spacing it. Long story short, I ended up skating for Silver Star. Okay. And then I skated for Silver Star for like two years, and then I ended up on Super Knot, which was like the, the Super Knot. <laughs> super <laughs> Knot. <laughs> which you was like, the, I, no, 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 it was great, but just like if you think about it. <laughs> yeah, it's too good, it's too good. So that was like the last boards, but like iPath was like my real main thing. That was like my check for. Many years. That's how I lived in Spain. Like, in the end, like, I rode for Matt Rodriguez's company called Uprise, but, like, my main, like, you know, $1,000 a month was uh, from iPath. Well, that's what I wanted to get into with the next question, because that was a real era right there. It was a real era. And, And like, iPath, yeah. And, like, that, I mean, and I'm not just saying this because I was a part of it, but if you look at that free 
what do you call it, the free promo video, mm -hmm. that video changed skateboarding. I'm sorry. Like mm -hmm. all the, I mean, not what I was doing or Kenny or Carl, but like what Matt Rodriguez was doing at Universitat with all those combinations of those tricks, right after that skateboarding change and you see all these kids doing these yeah. combos of tricks on ledges and manual things, like it really influenced it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then they sold it to Timberland and then the old owner besides Matt Field told Timberland to fire all of us. So they kind of like knocked the whole movement out of skateboarding. Mm -hmm. And that was yeah. it. I mean, I'll, like, I'll never forget, I was sitting on a bench near Via Latana in Spain <laughs> yeah. with Mikey Fox. Michael and Fox. on April 26th, which is my brother's birthday. Oh, you remember? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I remember this exact <laughs> day. I'll never, forget, I'll never forget this. And then Matt texting me and being like, we sold the company to Timberland. And I was, and he's like, everything's gonna change. Like we're going to port, we're going to Costa Rica, private jet. Everyone's gonna make all this money. I was like, oh wow, amazing, mm -hmm. finally, or not finally, but like the whole team was supposed to cash in on the that? whole team was gonna cash in. And then two months went by, my wire didn't go through, mm -hmm. like normally the wire goes through. Then they asked me for a W nine. Then I had a dream, and I was like, yo, this is over. They're gonna fire me. Mm -hmm. I had a dream that I got fired. Then I called Matt. I was like, am I get fired? Because you got to tell me because I'm living like month to month. Oh, no, no, it's all good. It's all good. Mm -hmm. That was it. I got some email from the owner. And before I opened it, I was like, this is it. It's like, dear Tony, thank you for all the years of your contribution. But unfortunately, we're revamping the team and we're not going to be able to send you shoes uh, internationally anymore. Mm -hmm. And for like five minutes, I was like, you know, wrote an email, like, you don't know, da, da, da. and then I was like, okay, that's it, it's over. Mm -hmm. And that was it. That was yeah. like 2007. And then I think they kept it going. But like I started working with them in like 19, 1999. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I wanted to kind of talk about the whole era of iPath because I feel like iPath came into the game and brought something that it was totally different and like... You know, yeah. like it's something it, that was really organic and really niche, but like something that was completely different from, say, like I DC mean, shoes, where yeah. it's like it kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier. Um, like skaters are not just. It was. It was. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not gonna mention names. One of my really good friends is like a famous artist, and I he really inspired me, and I remember him laughing at me. He's like a Rasta shoe company <laughs> he's like a rasta spirit spirituality shoe company and then guess what in like three years he's like do you think you could get me some of those shoes i was like bitch remember when you were like laughing at this shit and now everybody's wearing it like they like we were kind of the last sh shoe brand other yeah. than like lakai and like dvs that mm. like had this niche but also it was like a movement in skating we had like the yogi thing like yeah. there was only like five or six of us that could like move our bodies like this and do certain things and mm -hmm. like i think it really inspired i did not realize it at the time because i was just in the thing but as years go by and with the internet i've had so many people you know reach out and be like thank you and i'm like for what mm -hmm. <laughs> you know I was, we're just being ourselves but like no you really influenced like a different type of practice in my mm -hmm. like s my, in my skateboarding so and yeah. the thing about it was that it was completely real like that's really it just it, just it wasn't happened. like a marketing no. scheme yeah. it was no, like no. that's who you guys really were you were yeah. into yoga you're into spirituality and you're into skateboarding yeah. and you brought you bring that to a shoe brand and it and it worked it worked. It worked beautifully. It really worked. And yeah. Matt Matt was a great designer, and and I don't say this term often, but he was fucking genius. Yeah. And he like, he curated the team where it was like Carl, me, Kenny, Matt Rodriguez, Matt Pales, Mike Dare, mm -hmm. all these people. In some sensibility, like is like a Pantone another of one another. Nate mm -hmm. Jones. Yeah. Like, it just had this thing and a feeling that, like, skating had nothing like that at the time, yeah. Yeah. you know? And kids loved it. Yeah, I definitely saw, like, Pier 7 kids, like, hip-hop kids that wear Nikes or whatever. Just, mm -hmm. like, kind of, like, sw some of them switched their style up. They're just rocking, you know, iPads. Wallabies. They were wallabies, walking the... You know? I mean, Matt took that shoe from the Wallabies and made mm -hmm. the cat. And then he had the Grasshopper. Then he yeah. was also ahead of the time with, like, the vegan and, like, making things out of plastic bottles. Like... Yeah. It was really, really, really that opened like a lot ahead. Of those minds. Mm -hmm. It did. It yeah. was. I mean, sounds corny, but it was like a conscious company before everyone jumped on like 
the green thing, yeah. you know? No, totally. Yeah. It was definitely way ahead of its time. Yeah, definitely. And it, like, it really helped you guys out in your oh, careers. Man. Like, oh, dude. It, like, for, you lived off that for a lot of years. Oh, I lived off that. I mean, I was about to get canceled <laughs> until I moved to Spain and like <laughs> I don't even know if that's the right term I was about to get cut no, that yeah. canceled didn't exist yeah yeah I remember like you guys started making like Carl started making really good money and then he bought that like Audi TT yep I remember He's that driving around San Francisco <laughs> with his little dreads yeah. flying out of the window showing up at the pier with Alon who was like a little miniature at yeah. the time and everybody was like, Carl got an Audi. Carl got an Audi. Carl made it. Audi, that's that's yeah. Carl made <laughs> it. Like keys. No, but it was yeah, amazing because yeah. at that time, <laughs> like at that time, other than hip hop, other than hip hop and skateboarding, it was the only thing you could still come up from the street. Mm-hmm. In art world, sometimes, but mainly hip hop and skating is like the only thing you could fully come up. Like mm-hmm. Stevie, little yeah, Stevie, yeah. dude. Like amazing story. Mm-hmm. You know, like. And Steve. Carl, because Carl was like, everyone knew Carl was amazing, but Carl never had a big brand. Like, mm-hmm. he rode for Justin's company, Mad Circle, but iPath is the one that, like, got him the scroll. Totally. Yeah. Totally. That, that one, iPath kind of took Carl to another level. Well, I mean, his skating and the it, combination of the two, obviously. Totally. And that first yeah. shoe was so crazy. It had a seam in the middle. That one, yeah, oh, yeah. I forgot was, about that it, one. It was, good so, one. it was so, I mean, that was like my go-to shoe mm-hmm. when in in the beginning skating. Mm-hmm. Well, no, was that the, se- it was called the Panther. Was that the first one? One was or called the, se- the Cat, right? Was that the, the Wallaby? The Cat was the one that looked like the Wallaby. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah iPath took it to the shoe, next level. Yeah. They did. <laughs> some, some of them were too bulky, but some of them were yeah. really dope. Yeah. So when did you decide you're in SF? You you get on iPath. When do you decide to move to Barcelona? I mean, I didn't. I mean, it sounds ridiculous, but it it like chose me. I went to London <laughs> for this thing called of side effects of your thing, mm-hmm. which was Toby Shaw and Nikki Nikki Gard and Louise and Bacall. They were curating this big art show that had like sculptures and like art so they got me a ticket out to london so i was in the show and then justin strubing had married a catalan woman and they're like you should ingrid ingrid (laughs) yes you should go you should go to barcelona you will love it so in 2003 i went i bought an easy jet ticket for like 25 euros from london to barcelona Mm -hmm. okay and then i went to barcelona and uh that was it. I was supposed to be there a month, and then me, Kenny, Quentin, Jerry, and Javi went to Turkey, mm-hmm. and then I came back and was like, I'm not going back. <laughs> <laughs> so I stayed like six months, uh-huh. and then... How many times did you change your flight? Like five. <laughs> like 300 bucks every time or something? <laughs> At one point, I just like canceled it, and then eventually, yeah, and then eventually ended up on tour in like scotland or something so they bought me like a completely different ticket Mm -hmm. but then i went back to san francisco for like a year in 2005 i stayed there the whole year to try to get my life together and then 2000 the end of 2005 i went back to barcelona and that was it Mm -hmm. i kind of was like there main mainly were you over sf or were you just in love with barcelona i just was in love with barcelona Mm -hmm. It, it gave me the energy that like sf and new york city used to give me it was like Mm -hmm. i was having deja vu all the time just like the energy from the street and just like being inspired it just felt like the place it felt like the place is where like i should be Mm -hmm. yeah i was just in barcelona last week and it's like that place really still has it's it's like a drug dude no it's like crack i can't it's like you can't can't, you can't get enough get over it (sighs) It still has. It really still does have that mojo, but thank God it still has that mojo because it did hit like a what do you call it when it gets um, revamped, uh, spacing. Uh, uh, when you like a neighborhood gets bought out. Oh, uh, so, like uh, uh, gentrified. Re- regentrified, but it didn't really. They built mm-hmm. like that W hotel and mm-hmm. like some new buildings, but it still has that spirit of Spain mm-hmm. or, or of Barcelona. Yeah, you know, yeah. it has that like that street feeling and. People are still humble and they're they don't make a lot of money and it's it's like it's it's still so awesome. Mm-hmm. Well, Amy, I don't I don't know if you remember Amy, our of friend. Of course, Amy. from Australia. She, yeah, we were talking about it and she was like, you know, the thing with with Barcelona is that it's a it's like a moment in time that doesn't change. Which it's an is infinite beautiful. moment of time. So because you go back there and you're like, this is a place that like, it's just so familiar 
and like everything is always the same and you're which is some people frown upon that but like no i think it's great because it doesn't like i think a lot of people that would come from new york especially americans were like really frustrated with how slow it is and how long it took to get service but i'm like yo this is the beauty of it like calm down Mm -hmm. like you're not gonna win the human race here like Mm -hmm. nobody is racing or trying to get on top of one another so just enjoy this (laughs) this is culture Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah you gotta turn stuff off sometimes and just like Kind of go without. Totally. Yeah. Hit that mangarita. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I should I should have got one. Yeah, you should have got one. Okay. I mean, you know. <laughs> pour, pull Next a four lo- uh, four loco out of the vault. <laughs> that would have been good. Do you think your time there was well spent, or did you do you think you got caught up in the party? Um, I think my time was well spent there because I dealt with I dealt with my sexuality. I got to live my life and mm. I got to skateboard and also I photographed the whole time there which is like I had this bag with me the whole time mm-hmm. and somehow I made it home every single night with my camera except once so I photographed that whole time of five years there's about 600 rolls of film sitting in my fridge that have never been processed now yes still yes oh my god yeah so not just from that time, but from mm-hmm. like that whole time from like 2001 to like 2009 when it all ended. So, yeah, I f- for me, that was productivity. Like I documented a time that was a moment for myself and all of us. And when I process that, it's going to be like Christmas. What are you waiting on? Twenty thousand dollars <laughs> from some corporation <laughs> to give me the money. Come on, guys, twenty G. <laughs> we'll start a GoFundMe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> fund him. What yeah. were you gonna say? What about that one time though? You said you said that you made it home every time, but that one time. Oh my God, that <laughs> one that's what, that's what time. Oh my let God, me, that me one. That story. This is the one time. It was two thousand four, and I was with my friend Ricky who's from Mexico City. Mm. And I met, this guy, City. I met this guy, Tocha, who's from Bilbao, who's friends with Javi, and Ricky and Mirto from Greece. These are the people that, like, introduced me to, like, the after hours. Okay. So one night I'm out with Ricky, and it's, like, the night before I'm supposed to fly to Scotland to go on tour, and we're in front of some hotel shaking the trees. <laughs> <laughs> the police, like, pull us over. We almost go to jail. Mm-hmm. So then we go to Barceloneta, like literally pass out. And then I get home with not that bag, but a similar bag. And my camera is gone. Of course. Mm. So I go back to the beach. Of course, it did not fall out. I got robbed. <laughs> Even if it and did, then it it's like I, yeah. Then I start crying. And then I call Anton. Do you know Anton? And Anton's the Swedish guy? Yeah, the yeah. Swedish photographer. He's taking me to the airport. And the only thing I really cared about was the fucking roll of film that was in that camera. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Not the camera, was (laughs) the images that I took from that night that are now lost from just being, Mm. you know, ridiculous. So it wasn't that you even got robbed, you just passed out and then... On the beach, yeah. Yeah. I only got robbed once in Spain. No, maybe twice. One other time this dude tried to rob me, and he had me, he was doing the thing, and then he had me like in a back alley, and I was like, oh my God, this guy is my fucking passport. Really? Like I had, it was the first night I got there, and I was stupid enough to have my passport. And luckily enough, it was like, which hands it in? So mm. I like reached in his pocket, pulled it out, and was like, just turned around and walked away. And he didn't try to like, because that's the thing that in Barcelona, the thieves they're not very violent. Yeah. They're not. Yeah. They, they, they just they're not. pickpocket you. And if they, you catch them, they're like, oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like such a mess. They're like yeah, such God. masters, like how mm. they can do that. Oh, and the other other time I got my phone stolen was when Lily died. Remember Lily? I do. Yeah. So Lily, that night that I found out she died, I'm walking down Los Rambles, and they're doing the soccer thing, hitting you, and I had my phone in my top pocket, Mm -hmm. and they got my, like, you know, my amazing Nokia that looked like... (laughs) (laughs) They just saw, like, electronics. They didn't even see it. I don't even know how they got into that pocket and got it, but they got my phone, and then I got home and was like, oh, man, so stupid to even, like... Because I was drunk and upset and just, like, screwing with those guys. Yeah. Well, the thing, I got lucky there. I mean, this sounds crazy, but I got lucky there. But I like my dark skin. They usually go for like the white, white, white <laughs> like drunk English looking tourists. Yeah. Yeah. Well, until I opened my mouth because I was 
like scruffy and like more tan. Like mm -hmm. they never knew I was not from Europe until yeah. I like opened my mouth. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I was lucky. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you talked about this earlier, but you mentioned that you went to Sans once. I went to Sans like three times. Yeah. But this is the day. One of the days that you went to Sans is the day that you got the Trans World cover. Yes, this day almost, the day I got the cover almost didn't exist. We had been out all night, like, whatever, doesn't matter, all night. And Kenny's like, I never really did that organized skating thing where they're like, come skate, meet up. So it was like, Kenny's like, meet us. I went with Toussaint with Kenny and Paul Shire and Jack Curtin, Justin Strubing and Quentin. And we're waiting for Pete Thompson to show up. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm going to get out of here. I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't do this. And I'm like skating <laughs> off. I'm like literally <laughs> skating off. And cause that, that wait, that. wait, one question. If you, how did you, how did your skating, if you didn't do like meetup, like how did it usually go down? Kind of just like spontaneously. Mm -hmm. Normally if we went with a photographer or, or a videographer, it would just be like me and a friend. Okay. Like I never went with like a crew. Yeah. But Kenny's like, just come. And then I'm like literally skating off and Kenny's like, don't leave. Uh -huh. So I'm like, all right. So I was like, we got to leave right now. I'm like, this is not my thing. So we take off in a part of Barcelona that I'd never skated. Then Justin's in front of us and we start skating. And we start seeing those like those, waves. Hump, those mm -hmm. weird hump waves. And I'm watching Justin go off them. And then by the time we're going to skate this like bank to bar thing for Kenny. And by the time we get there, I like really learned how to throw my body off of it. So we go to skate Kenny's spot. He does this thing. And then Pete's like, let's go back and take this thing. Mm -hmm. So we went back, took this, took this photo. I think it was like October. And my memory is crazy. I can't yeah. remember all this. So it was like October of like 2003. And on my birthday, again, like it was, it was for the um, like photo issue of like, 2004 because the magazines come out ahead mm -hmm. we're sitting at that place uh paraguay like that parallel no it was like a uruguay restaurant underneath like uh. it was like that meat restaurant mm -hmm. and we're sitting there and they hand me the cover and within three it was the quickest it was only only took two photos mm -hmm. the first time i was in spain for six months and one was the cover and on my birthday they hand me the magazine mm -hmm. at the birthday dinner that's and I was amazing. like shocked. Awesome. I could not <laughs> believe it. You know, I was like, and that saved my career for like five years. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk about that, but see how it comes full circle because you said you skated launch ramps when you were a kid. Exactly. And that's it's the cover. Oh, I'm gonna have to post it on Instagram. Yeah. He's launching off of this. There's these like little street bumps. Oh yeah. And he's yeah. doing over a the rail. There's a rail. No, right? it's not a rail. No. It's just like a big. It's just a big like bump that's but it's only like this wide so yeah. you had to like oh, be precise yeah. oh, but that was my that. thing is launch ramps as a kid yeah exactly and when the time it came out like street grabs were looked down upon mm -hmm. but then that like you know then all of a sudden you start seeing kids doing like you know melancholy is down like double sets and <laughs> all that stuff it was like a fluke it wasn't supposed to happen it was actually the last issue of trans world before before dave swift and grant started the skateboard mag mm -hmm. and i knew them from when i lived in san diego so they kind of just like they're like we're gonna give tony the cover can i ask did either of you ever see that kid's studio from the pier do a benihana over the pier block i remember he used to no. show up and do oh, that all the time danny gonzalez it was Danny Gonzalez, but there was a kid's studio, too. That was his name? Studio? His, he, yeah, he studio? was a kid that was studio like... Studio Lines I guess it might have been his graffiti name or whatever, but that's what we called him. I never saw But he was just that. a I young remember. kid that would show up, and he would do that stuff. We're like, what the fuck? No, I don't... Yeah. I My don't. Bad. I just we were like wasted in Makba when yeah. that was happening, yeah. when you guys were over there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's true. We were, we were, we were, were like in like some dream bubble. <laughs> like, what's up, dude? Yeah. yeah. Hey. <laughs> you know, flamingos. I'm, 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 I'm gonna meet you at flamingos <laughs> afterwards. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> say, What's it's up? funny that that grab. I mean, you look like you're doing yoga in the air, basically. Oh yeah. <laughs> you got to see this cover. I'll, I'll post it on Instagram after or something. But oh, yeah, please amazing. do, man. Yeah. <laughs> I really liked all those like those launches and just the style, of the grabs and the people. The you know, like you guys brought out like Reed and you and like. Mm. Even that um, shout out to Vic, the filmer, like he posted some stuff uh, of you on the barriers. Oh, yeah. Launching out. Dude, the that's, thing, like, 
that's real good. Yeah. yeah, I don't even remember. I remember, I remember Vic being there, and I remember going there, but like I, I didn't realize there was like footage of that, and that's yeah. that's the beauty of, of from the time that we're from is like when something shows up and you're like, oh my god, mm-hmm. whoa, like I totally forgot about that. Did you ever get any? Because skateboarding, especially in the '90s, it was like super. There was like all these unwritten rules, and you were skating super differently. Did anybody ever like kind of give you shit about it? Or like no, like I realized, like you know, skateboarding and artists are like all super insecure, and like they are. They're like some of the most insecure <laughs> people ever. So it's like when I finally became comfortable with my body mm-hmm. and like what I could do on a skateboard and I realized what I owned it's like the same as like making art mm-hmm. you just you just excel off that and when I realized I could do something that other people couldn't instead of me having to do everything else everyone else had to do to be accepted or put on the map it changed mm-hmm. and San Francisco changed that for me and the terrain and Barcelona too you know it was like all these things finally that like I could really skate as opposed to like, yeah, I can do a kickflip backside tail side. It's going to take me like 8,000 tries, yeah. but do I really need to do that and since like Gino did it switch and looked amazing to the Wu-Tang song? <laughs> 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 do you know what I mean? Yeah. And like, but no one, no one really ever, like at a point people kind of like, uh, they were more supportive of it. They're mm. like, that's crazy. Like, I want to see more. Mm-hmm. And that was also part of being, like, the the iPath crew or tribe, you know? Like, it was supported within that system that everyone... Carl was on his own thing. Carl was very ahead of his time, too, with all, totally. like, the switch all his feeble tricks. stuff and mm-hmm. all his tricks and manuals and stuff. So it was, like... No, if anything, in the end, it was, like, th- they were all very supportive. Mm-hmm. That's incredible. That's cool. You had a lot of crazy sequences in bars. Uh, you didn't. You, you did like. Uh, you went off that one ramp into another, into one bank oh, into yeah. another bank. Was that one the second sh- photo you shot? That was like the third thing yeah. I ever so shot. So you did more than two. I remember. No, no, th- that was that was the <laughs> year after. That was when Oliver Barton got to Spain uh, and lived okay. with Kenny. But that was like, I mean, all those things except like the thing on the cover. Like all the other things were things that were like kind of like. Uh, a dream Mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden i'm riding away and was like did that really just happen yeah (laughs) like that thing that ollie with um with oliver like i i'll never forget the feeling of that i never that's one thing i do miss about skateboarding is like i miss like the flow and the fact that like i was literally flying for Mm -hmm. years and now i'm just on my feet you know walking like the other pedestrian (laughs) stuck in my mind (laughs) and like I i really do miss that those sensations of being able to skateboard yeah well, I mean, I mean, I skate around. Somebody watching is gonna be like, "Go to, go to the skate park, dude." You yeah, still yeah, got right. it, bro. Yeah, yeah, you got it, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Don't stop. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I want to go stop. somewhere at my like. I'm not like older or nothing, but like I want to just go skate by myself sometimes, like yeah. it, or like when it's open. I just want to like. I don't want to be bothered. I, don't I, know. I did that a lot at, at points. If there was something really that I wanted to do, I would just go like try it on my own. I didn't need like an audience. Yeah. Because that's the other thing in skateboarding. It's like you can make art, you can make music, you can make fashion. Mm. But in skating, the only person that's going to do it and right away is you. Mm-hmm. Yep. Nobody is going to make you do that thing. Preach. And all these other things, it's like, Yes, you can come up with an idea, a craft, but you can have a crew of people. But skating, it's like it's all it's like will of the way. Yeah, That's it's a very up to interesting you. way of looking at it. Yeah. Yeah. No, because like Gon sent or not Adidas sent me some shoes and like they felt like how I used to skate, like tight and slippers, and I was like, I'm gonna go skating. So I went down to like City Hall and there's this ledge and this old trick I never like did. And I'm looking at it. And I was like, yeah, I want to do this. And I was like, Tony, do you really want to do this? <laughs> Don't you remember how much energy it used to take? And now you're here by yourself. Are you really going to sit here and try to do this by yourself? <laughs> I was like, I doubt it. But it made me re- re- remember being like, you know, everyone's sitting in the van. Or you got it. Next one. Yeah. Next try. I swear. Next yeah. try. Next try. But it's you. Pretty nerve-wracking. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. You never thought about that. It's like yeah. you are the one that is going to pull it or right mm-hmm. away. It's like mm-hmm. nobody else is going to make you do yeah. that. That's true. Yeah. Well, going back to the cover, how did it? You said it changed your. Li- it it helped. It made. It oh, I tell that, <laughs> that changed. It gave my you life. another four years no, of like free like money. Five, it gave me like <laughs> five, gave me five years of like five more not years having of to do anything <laughs> again. Free well, no, money for five true. more that years. That wasn't true. I really did like. I really 
I mean, I skated. I, it sounds weird, but I never really, really tried to document skateboarding where I was like, this is going to be my drop. This is going to be my video part with this song. It was like, I did what I did. But like for the iPrath promo, I was around Mikey Fox mm -hmm. and Jack Sabak. And they're a little bit younger me, than me, but Jack was having his moment and he was so as inspiring to be around. So I really did try for that... Um, for that promo, but we only only really had like a year to do it. And like, if you think about it, most video parts usually take like people like three years. Yeah, so. and it's all planned out. And it's all planned out, but that was all, we, yeah. they were like giving us money to travel. So a lot of that footage was very s spontaneous. It was like, mm -hmm. I'm gonna go here and do this, which, yeah. which was great. But it did, that photo of what you're saying, it did save my career for like five years. Which is crazy. <laughs> One thing gave me five more years to just like well, be in a bubble. That's the hype. They're like, they're like, they, they, they glowed you up for a little bit. Yeah. So you're just like, yeah. hang out for a little bit. And then it all ended. <laughs> <laughs> a blessing or a curse? Yeah, yeah, it was know. a blessing. Yeah. I was ready to move on. It's well, like, how do you walk away from that yeah. when they're giving you that money? Yeah. Well, let's. Who was your? You never lived because there was that crew that lived in the house. It was like Shire Reed. I never Vince. lived in that. You one. You never lived in that house. No, right? I lived in the house with Yvonne and Joanne and Vanessa and Javi. Mm -hmm. Minda and the, Zawal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mendazawa. Mendazawa, <laughs> Dio. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then when I first moved there, I lived at Ingrid's house. And it was like, she they were living at Ingrid's parents. But it was me, uh, Marina. I don't think you ever met. This is before mm. or like in between when you... When we weren't there at the same time, and then mm. then I lived in the and I live in Mirto and Amalia's house. I lived with Gree and Yvonne, and then I lived with Yvonne and Joanne pretty much the okay. rest of the time. And oh, at one yeah. point, I lived with Kenny, and I took Jerry's old room, or Jerry had paid for this room, and I just stayed in his room. Jerry he, Sue? Yeah, okay. he never came back. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Jerry for yeah. paying the rent. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Jer thanks, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> Were you, so were you there? There's an infamous fight story with Kenny Hughes. Where oh he, my God, no! Where he beat up the Spanish. He beat up like three dudes <laughs> in the back of the square. But he beat up the Spanish punks. You yeah. weren't there for that. No, oh, I man, was not. I wanted you. I wanted that story so bad. He beat up people quite a few times. <laughs> he beat up the guards at the city hall, but like the most notorious was when the back of the square off. Um, I can't. He's, I can't still say that word. He's school he is. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That. That's the first uh, street I lived on. But behind that square, when he like fought like three of those Moroccan dudes and beat the shit out. Of oh, all I thought them. they were like punks. Oh no, I thought it was Moroccans. Oh. All I know is that like, they're all Kenny Hughes, Shire, and some other people are walking, and some where dudes, that bump to like chair yeah. thing is, and like the. The English breakfast place says. <laughs> Some I, dudes rolled up. And I heard Kenny got hands. <laughs> oh, yeah. Dude, yeah. he is. And then, I'm, I'm, glad Kenny, I'm glad he was my friend. <laughs> I don't know if you're watching, time. but. <laughs> I'm glad he Shout was my Kenny. friend. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I guess the story was that, like, three dudes rolled up. They might have been punk dudes. They might have been, I don't know what they were. But, like, one of them had a knife, and then, like, Kenny beat up all three, but then, like, Shire, <laughs> Shire and everybody else ran. ran. <laughs> <laughs> of course they did. And he That's just, like, the, he yeah. just took, he took the house down. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they did. They all ran. I don't know if Kenny Reed was there, but I know Paul was, yeah. and, like, he just, like, he handled it. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, it's, it was interesting because... Because he was, like, one of the... There wasn't many black people there. No. They had, like, brown... You had brown people, but it was like pretty white, you know, pretty white community. Well, that was the interesting thing because we would roll around with Kenny Hughes because he, well, that was our crew, and like all these dudes in Barcelona would like want to test him. And you're like, yo, you're trying to test that dude? Like, That's he's going yeah. to put hands on yeah. you, he's yeah. going to destroy you. Yeah. Like, and he did, and like, he did. all the time. <laughs> he did. He had to. He had to go to court. <laughs> he had to go to court for the thing. I remember, if I remember correctly, for the thing at City Hall. Because they were just they were fucking with him. Because yeah. it's like you know it was a race thing. It was incorrect. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. Damn. Yeah. I wish. I, I love Kenny. Yeah. Right, wherever Big he Hughes. is, yeah, he's, he's around. He's he's around. in New York. Yeah. yeah he okay. Lives in New York. Yeah, yeah. I tried yeah. to get him on the show a bunch of times, but he won't do it. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Kenny, we Kenny, need you come to come. To, yeah, we need we you do. to come we tell us stories. stories. Yeah. We need these stories for yeah. sure. <laughs> Man. So I mean, 
Barcelona, as much as we all love it, like there has to come a time where you're like, okay, reality has to sink in, and you're like, this can't be forever. Like when did uh, that, when did did you? Did that I mean, it was. I mean, after the iPad thing ended, I got stuck there mm -hmm. because I was living check to check, and then I started making like. I mean, I always made art, but then I like focused on like having a real practice. Mm -hmm. So I had an art show there. I went to that. Yes, yeah, I had yeah. an art show there at this place called Fashion Dogs mm -hmm. that my friend Lolo had this weird space up in Gracia. So then that show from making art, my friend Ben Cho was a, he's an artist, but a fashion designer. He wanted to bring me back to work on his collection. So Alana ended up getting the ticket. So I came back and worked for Ben, helping him with his collection. Then I went back to Spain. Mm -hmm. And then I went to Berlin for okay. my friend David Sherry's art show. And we went to Bergheim. If you know what that is. Yeah, that club. Yeah, that club. A club that never closed. There's a the club in Germany in Berlin that never closes. Yeah. Really? Yeah. So after being at that club for a day, my... <laughs> I have so many questions. Yeah. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Anyways, long story short, I met this guy, Justinian, at the club who is... He lives here. And he's like, so what do you do? And at this point, I wasn't skating. So I was like, I make art. <laughs> he's like, well, if you want to make it, you got to come back to New York. And I was like, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> so I went back to Barcelona. I went broke. And uh. I called Justinian and was like, he's like, look, you give me a piece of art, I'll buy you a one-way ticket. So I came back to New York in 2008 of September 2nd. And I was laughing. I was like, oh, this is going to be this so... This is a guy you met at a club. I met him at a Germany. club, but he was friends with David Sherry. Okay. Like, it was a common person. He's okay. like an agent. He takes mm -hmm. care of, like, Mel Ottenberg and all those people. And no offense, in the art world at this time, you're like, no, Nothing. Yeah. Like, no I mean, like, I had been in shows and, like, in some reviews, but, like, nothing... So I moved back, and then the economy collapsed uh -huh. five days later, and it like changed the whole game. Uh -huh. So slowly I focused on art and practice, and then all that stuff kind of took place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How did Ben Cho, because this is before social media, and uh, he, pa he passed away. He passed away like, about four yeah. years ago. Yeah. Rest in yeah. Peace. Rest in peace. Um, how did he, you know, before the social media era, how did he see your show? He was... A part of our crew, he did, he was friends with Brian DeGraw, and they did Sway. They did mm -hmm. Smith's Night. But Ben was like, I met Ben through Athena Curry, which was Andre Razo's um, first, uh, or was his wife. So he was just a part of our crew. And Ben, like, he just was like a brother, yeah. you know. And he really influenced my practice. Mm -hmm. So, like, the way that he used everyday objects for his fashion thing is, like, it also, like, came off in my practice. Mm -hmm. So he saw the postcard for the show that it did in Spain and brought me back and wanted me to work with him. Mm. So then I got back, and then I was, like, hustling for six months, and then my friend David's like, yo, you got to get a job because... <laughs> Because I still had the skate mentality. Yeah. I was like, you know, selling Dude, that boards. That mentality is so hard to let go and then of. I, yeah. And then I got a job at a cafe called Snice. And mm -hmm. then that's when it was like, all right, that part of my life is over. Mm -hmm. I'm moving on, which is so hard to do. You know, yeah. man. You know. So yeah. that was it. I had a job for a year at a cafe. I rode the train from Washington Heights to Park Slope every day. Ooh. Yeah, I did that's the math. A, that's a mission. I did the math. <laughs> I was spending, like, I was working five, six days a week. I was spending two days underground a month on the train <laughs> to work for $65 a day in cash. <laughs> but the only, it's it's a humbling but experience. The only, nobody yeah. would hire me because I didn't have a job yeah, for 15 years. Yeah, what are you going to put on your resume? Yeah, yeah. So, this guy, so this guy, yeah, grabs. 360 kickflip <laughs> burial over the hip. No, but this guy, yeah, Mike, this guy, Mike, that owned the cafe was friends with Ali Asha Moore. And Ali Asha Moore, who did ADI mm -hmm. and Fat Farm and all those things, he was another one of the first people. He was my actual first person that like started hooking me up in skating when I was like 12, mm -hmm. from meeting cool. him at a demo. Yeah. But yeah, all that stuff like shifted towards art, and then that was it. And then it all kind of worked out. Yeah. And then like things are shifting now. I stopped my own practice, and now I'm running like a private space out of We're my apartment. We're gonna get to that. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna get to that. But I mean, 
I did the same. I mean, the same thing happened to me in Barcelona. Like, I was writing for Santa Cruz. I was being an idiot. I wasn't taking it seriously. I didn't think about the future. I just took lived life day by day. And then one day, Santa Cruz called me. I was in flamingos. And <laughs> <laughs> I was in flamingos. And Santa Cruz was yep. like, we're not going to renew your contract. And I was like, oh, OK. Yeah. And, and, and that was your month. You didn't have probably any money. I'll have saved. another drink. No, I, <laughs> no. I had a, like, you, a couple Gs, but like. Yeah. No, and I was like, oh, okay, cool. Damn. And then next thing you know, you're just overseas in Barcelona. Like, <laughs> how did I get here? And then, and what, you, wh you what got am your, I doing? You, you st I got there because of my stuck myself <laughs> there. Yeah. yeah, you know what I mean. And you're like, dude, this is insanity. <laughs> As an adult now, I think I feel like a rel relatively logical, you know, adult. Like. I think it was absolutely absurd. <laughs> like I just went to this country and yeah. like put all my stuff in storage and like I don't hey, know. Same, same lived thing. check to check and yeah. skated every day and made no plans for the future at all. The dream. <laughs> but it's beautiful at the same time. But now it's like at this age, like even with these young kids, they are not gonna do that. <laughs> no, well they're a little bit smarter than us. Well a lot of them have, have <laughs> a lot of them have trust funds. <laughs> They have mom and dad paying for it. <laughs> when you were in Spain, between the time when it kind of like ended and your the iPad thing ended, and then um, you left, how was that transitional period for you? Were you having a lot of anxiety? Were you? No, like I wasn't having anxiety because it was the same thing as like San Francisco, um, like what do you call it? San Francisco, 1994, 95. Like, lucky enough, I had all this stuff that I got for free, and mm -hmm. and I and I. It sounds corny, but I doc like I journaled all this stuff. I would go to the square and be like, I sold Javi's shoes for fifty euros. I sold this board for thirty five. Some days I would make like two hundred fifty, three hundred dollars a day in yeah. euros from selling stuff at the square. Yeah. My rent was three hundred. So if I did that for three days in a row and made that amount of money, yeah, I was living. Yeah. But yeah, when it good. really came down to it was like when I went back to New York to work with Ben and then I saw all my friends and was like, all right, it's kind of time to make a decision to go back. And mm -hmm. But I didn't want to go back to San Francisco because that was like where I was living with the skate thing. I wanted to go back to New York and like have a different like um, chapter in my life. Mm -hmm. And it was. But like that, honestly, that last year between when iPath ended and then getting back to America was incredible. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was like, I did not want to go back. We're like literally like... <laughs> I mean, what happened was my friends uh, Lizzie and Brian came from Gang Gang Dance, and they were on tour, and their tour got canceled, and they got stuck at my house. So all of a sudden, they were stuck, and the band was stuck, and I'm like, look, my friend Justinian wants to buy me this ticket, and like Liz is like, I think it's time to come back, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, really? She's like, I, th I think it's time for you to come back to New York. And I was like, all right, I'm going to come back. Yeah. But then I got back, and it was like everything collapsed. So mm -hmm. it was like... I was fine with it because New York, uh, Spain was so poor. It's so like nothing really changed for yeah. me until I got the job. <laughs> until you got that snipe first job? Yeah. Well, not my first <laughs> job. That was only the third job I think uh, I had for like since high school. Mm -hmm. And whatever happened with when they sold iPath, whatever happened with that money? They never said anything? Matt got money, but the guy, the other guy that owned it got all the money. But then like once they sold it, all the core skate shops dropped it mm -hmm. and then they lost like a 15 million dollar company oh. then they had to like resell it and then they resold it again and then again i think it got sold like either i think it got i know it sold got twice but maybe three times so that the timberland lost like 15 million wow i don't know if that's a lot for them but i mean that's a lot for me i don't know that's a lot of money. i don't think, <laughs> I don't I don't think i've ever <laughs> made that much i don't know that's a lot for timberland, adding up all the years was yeah. timberland trying to like keep it going or were they just no, trying they, to shelve them you no know they mean? were gonna it was like it almost got sold three times, but none of the people were right. And then Timberland was green, and they also make amazing shoes. Like they have foot technology, so it seemed like the right thing to do. Yeah. Well, they probably didn't that realize how skaters, the how the world of skating works. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, like they need okay, you need those. You need skaters. the yeah. core market. Yeah. And like once they they kind of shot themselves in the foot by like like you said, all the shops dropped. They all dropped it, yeah. and they're like they had like zoomies or whatever yeah. then like all the main accounts come from the core of skating mm -hmm. yeah. that's what's amazing about skating i'm not sure if it's still the same but it's mm -hmm. like it was a core brand and now corporate america got into it and the skaters like uh-uh 
Yeah. Not after you dropped the reason, like not after you dropped all those people for the reason why we supported it. Mm -hmm. So that was awesome. But it was, for me, it was a very hard moment. It was like a decision to be like, am I going to get another shitty sponsor for $500 a month to keep going? Yeah. Or this is it. I'm done. I'm moving yeah. on. Which is hard because skaters, you know, it's a hard decision after living that lifestyle for so many years. The, the, one of the things that comes with it also is like it becomes your identity. Totally. And you're like, who am I? I'm Lee Smith, a pro skater. I'm an ex pro. Yeah, I'm, I'm an ex pro skater. But and so you you identify as that, and it's really hard to let that go. It to is. To be like, oh, I'm Lee Smith, a regular Joe Schmo who like takes. Barker train. Barker used to say <laughs> it, uh, it's Barker Barrett used to say it's called letting the hero die. Uh huh. And it's like you have to let this whatever hero or person inside you die in order to move on because it's like we've lived a certain way with a certain amount of attention and support, but then it's like. Now it's like, well, who am I if yeah. I don't have that? And I think that's what a lot of people also went through with like COVID. Uh huh. You know, not mm. to bring them back, but like no, they yeah. lost these fabulous jobs as stylists that they or like design. With, yeah. And that's they were like, point. and being out was their identity. And then all of a sudden it was like, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, they got to get more creative. <laughs> yeah. Or they have to just realize who they really are. And if they really want that, they're going to fight for it. And not that I really wasn't a skater, I just knew that. Because also we, a lot of these kids think it's so fabulous and amazing, but we sac we sacrificed a lot to get to that point. Mm -hmm. We slept on floors. We did not have beds. We like lived off nothing, mm -hmm. you know. And now with all this corporate money and all these kids making these monies, all this amount of money, it's just like, I think it's projected and it's a facade. It's just it's so different than what it really is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's a tough thing to let go. But I feel yeah. like in skating, the sooner, like, um, if you're not, like, a P-Rod or a costume or one of those dudes, kind of, like, the sooner you let it go, the better. Well, yeah. the, reason, <laughs> the reason I'll tell you why I let it go so early, because I was only, I mean, it wasn't that early, but it is kind of. Now, looking at some of the people from our generation still going, mm -hmm. I was 32 or 33, and I remember, like, being really, like, fucked up on alcohol riding bikes with Reese Forbes to his house mm -hmm. and then we got back to his house and he's like god I want to be able to walk away from this really like literally walk away and he's mm -hmm. like I want to be able to have my body mm -hmm. and I thought about it and I was like I do too man yeah I don't want to be having like my body be all crippled from just like doing this for 15 more years because I feel like I have to I wow. mean I want to skate but <laughs> not like to do it just to be my identity and for my, like, to survival. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, but that's why I, I, every time I talk about this, it's, like, not the act of skateboarding. It's the, act, it's the trying to make a living or a life yeah, off of skateboarding. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I mean, people, people confuse the two different yeah, things. Totally. You know? because Good, uh, yeah. you, people, and people keep it going, yeah. you know? But then it's, like, you look and you're, like, are you happy? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, you don't have to... You don't really have to merge into society and do anything else, but are you really happy with yeah. what you're doing? Yeah. What were you, what were you, what were you No, gonna say? I was just going to say, like, once some people let it go, too, like, it gets really far. It gets further and further away. Mm -hmm. You can't really, like, pick it up and be like, oh, yeah, let's go skate, whatever. Like, I mean, yeah. yeah. And I, know, I also feel like a lot of people that I know that got hurt and they quit, they gained a lot of weight. And yeah. I feel like I've never dealt with any of those issues, but mm -hmm. I don't work out or do anything. I just skateboard from time to time, and I mm -hmm. feel like I don't deal with any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you your know? body keeps its muscle memory, and, like, as long as – I mean, it's a it's a super active – I'm not going to call it a sport. It's more of, like, a moving meditation, but, yeah, like, exactly. you're in you – you're in – you are in tune with your body. So like, it's going to stay intact, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, and whether you're drinking or partying or whatever, you're still sweating every day and all yeah. that stuff is coming out of you as opposed to the people that are not anymore. And then you get fat and mm -hmm. dis no, diseasement of the body and all that you're stuff. You're saying exactly. Yeah. You know, what <laughs> so when you started working after all these years of skateboarding, I feel like there's two ways you can, was your mentality like this stability feels good this routine feels good or were you like this routine sucks it was really hard but at the time i had a boyfriend that like changed my life mm -hmm. and he is from lebanon he grew up in beirut he grew up underneath you know he grew up underneath the ground eating rice with like there's bombs going off his oh, whole man. time and when i met him he was saying i was hanging out with the wrong people mm -hmm. and i was hanging out with the, with a lot of fashion people partying, drinking, doing all that stuff. 
and he was basically like, you know, you have something to offer. You need to focus and give it. So basically, when he challenged me, I was like, watch this. <laughs> Did you get defensive at first? I was because, yeah, yeah, yeah. but he like came from nothing, you know, yeah. and he was a journalist and he worked at a, he worked for this company called Ahura, which is like a big Arab company. And he was going back and forth to DC to work for this channel to help like pay for his family in Beirut. But he was going to an Ivy, Ivy League school in Colombia. And I was like, yo, you got to like, you need to stop because you're going to a school, you're paying all this money and you need to hone in on your craft. Mm -hmm. So he, he really taught me a lot. And after a year and a half, like I had a studio on 39th Street that had no, it had a sink. There was no shower. There was a bathroom in the hall. And I was living with him and going back and forth to work. In the beginning, it was fine. But in the end, I dreaded it because mm -hmm. I was like, there was a guy in the kitchen that was a dickhead. And I was like, just like, I can't, this is horrible. Is like <laughs> I got, I was so used to having my own time and bubble, yeah, exactly. but it made me work for it again. And then all of a sudden, one day, I just like walked out and was like, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> you were well, like, it, fuck, wasn't, you, it wasn't, fuck you, fuck you. I did. I went you. back and I checked the silverware. <laughs> cool. He was like, fuck I'm you, out. Herman. <laughs> <laughs> and they all jumped back and I was like, let me have my $20 pay for half my day and peace. <laughs> was it, what, what was the straw that broke the camel's back on that situation? The guy, the <laughs> fucking cook, we were talking because I was a food runner and yeah. the guy started ringing the bell. And it just like, and I was in a uh, fight with my boyfriend, and I, he was going, dun, 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 and all these things went back, and I was like, yo, no, I can't fucking do this anymore. And I went back yeah. there, and I took the silverware tray, and was like, bah, 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 bah. and then he like jumped back, and then I was like, I'm out of here. And then like the people, I called the people that own the restaurant. I was like, I'm sorry. They're like, no, we're sorry. We know it's a, a, a bit much to deal with, but I was like, thank you, mm. but I'm done. Wow. And then that was it. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> so then you moved upstate after that. No, no. I stayed in New York, and we did like a do-it-yourself thing. I had one of the collectors that she's on the board of trustees at the Whitney Museum, and she gave us the space, and me and my friend Rasa did this pop-up show that looked like a gallery on Prince and Elizabeth. Okay. So that first show, with all Ross's contacts from working in fashion and me working like in the worlds I've worked in, we did this show and sold like half the show. So that, oh, wow. nice. yeah, during like the economy being tanked out, and then that got me this apartment in Chinatown, which was a real apartment, and I stayed in there for like a year, and then I moved upstate 2011 of August, and it's almost 10 years ago. What, what prompted the move? Brian was like my friend Brian DeGraw was like I want to move back upstate he lived with he lived at my house with me and my friend Bryce Cass in 2001 and he wanted to find another place so I was like find another place and I'll move mm -hmm. so he found this place on top of a mountain in Woodstock and when I got there I was like I'm not going back <laughs> <laughs> and then it's that was nice I, I stayed there for two years and I got my own place in a neighboring town and then I got a gallery. Then I just made exhibitions for three years. and Upstate. Upstate. I basically, like, whatever one through went through COVID, mm -hmm. I did by choice and okay. stayed in isolation for, like, eight years. Yeah, just you, were making quarant work. you quarantined yourself. I quarantined. <laughs> for eight yeah, years. For eight years. I, <laughs> <Damn>. <laughs> Sometimes on Instagram, it looked like you were going a little stir crazy. A little there. bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But did you have a car? Were you driving back no, and forth I had to a, the city? No, I would. There would be, like, months there'd be like four months where i'd come back to the city then i would get back and get off the bus and then i would like i would have to walk out of poor authority because i would get dizzy mm -hmm. and then it was just i i mean i was really by myself i i mean there's a community up there but i wasn't so much involved it wasn't there are some people i like how far up the mountain were you like miles uh, like yeah miles like two Man. miles up the road uh, on this mountain I, I would think like the air is different so you're breathing differently it, it and is. just like mm. you know it is but i didn't realize it because i was just there all the time but Damn. when i started going back and forth last year i realized that it is different yeah mm. that's interesting a little town <laughs> it's not a town there's like the post office is gone and <laughs> it's just a mountain <laughs> yeah so climb you climb it you climb the ranks into the art world do you feel like are there parallels between that world and the skate world? Do you did anything that you learned from the skate world kind of help you in the art yes, world? Yes, it did. It learned for me to not get hustled and okay. like to get mm -hmm. like the bro deal. You mm -hmm. know, it was like, uh, 
<laughs> no, Mm-mm. don't think so. Not going to work like this. Yeah. But I learned a lot from skating and like the hustle and the industry and business when I went into the art thing. Mm-hmm. I got very, very, very lucky. The platform I got, I was with one of the oldest galleries in the industry. But the same thing in the end, after my last exhibition, I knew it was going to tank. It was kind of like iPath. And <laughs> luckily, I started preparing before it tanked because then a year later, it all dissolved. Well, what, what's all like what, what tanked exactly? Well, they are a gallery of 80 years and they actually had a board. Mm-hmm. So the board wanted certain people out that were the directors. So they lied and said that it's over. They're going to cancel the gallery and it's only going to be um, like a secondary market thing, but um, they lied <laughs> and they kept the gallery going. But they fired all the directors. Now there's this big lawsuit. One person's trying oh, to, wow. one person trying to sue for ten million, and the oh, board's wow. trying to sue for eight million. And in the end, none of it has to do with art. It all mm-hmm. has to do with business and money, and it's disgusting. Yeah. So. Yeah. Huh. That's. I so wanted to ask you a question. Now that the world is so woke. Um, for lack of a better term, like, do you feel pressure to like, kind of, push art and that's in that kind of realm, or well, I mean, create art that's in that realm. I haven't made artwork since my last exhibition, <laughs> <laughs> which was how long ago exactly? Uh, it was two years ago on June twentieth. Oh, I went to that one too. Yeah, you did. Come it was to at that Marlboro, right? Yeah, yeah, it was at Marlboro. So now what it's pushed me to do is start my own thing out of my apartment in Chinatown and give people a platform that are these artists that are amazing that the art world's just kind of sleeping on. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of like taking their art and living with it and through it and with my own thing. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, how many many shows, besides what you're doing now, how many art shows have you done? You mean with, with the thing out of the apartment or just with mine? Like besides the apartment, like just with you, like we starting from Barcelona to like... Oh, okay. So I have d- I did three solo exhibitions with Marlboro, mm-hmm. and that was all hand embroidery work. So each one of those exhibitions either took two to three years. Oh, wow. So within eight years, I produced... One was a, one was a group, a two-person show with my childhood friend, Matthew Renee. So that was eight years of my life. And then I've been in several other group shows. I've been in one museum show at the Jewish Museum. And I, I don't really know. I haven't yeah. looked at the CV for a long time. It's kind of like a, making a video part. It's yeah. the same thing. <laughs> and if I was yeah, and if I was a kid in skateboarding, I would look at my video part. If I skated for Supreme or one of these companies... Or vans, or any of it, I would take my video part as an extra piece and be like, I'm gonna sell it to you for 30 grand. And look at it as a piece of art, like you pay me all these months Mm -hmm. to make this work, but when you get the final piece, it's like your masterpiece. You know? Uh, You might be onto something. (laughs) Isn't that like what an NFT is? (laughs) <laughs> no, no, because because those disappear. Oh, because those disappear off and on. A video part lives forever. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Well, nobody's ever thought about it like that, like because because it is a work of art. It is, if and I'm you spent three years, and it's your body, yeah, mm-hmm. and your your soul, if you want to go that far. But it's like I would be trying to sell that to the people that employ me as well as an extra piece, because yes, you get your what do you call it minimum a month but also this is your this is your album Mm -hmm. yeah this is your this is your book Mm -hmm. this is your art show Mm -hmm. you know so like does that not make sense i know that sounds crazy but doesn't make sense so these kids get taken care of and then that money they can take aside and set it aside Mm -hmm. that makes a lot of sense I remember when I felt myself kind of slowing down and I had people like filming around me, I was like, I, it wasn't like a big part, but I was like, I want to make a part, a skate part, right? Yep. And w- I collected, and just like you said, you collect your part, your stuff, so and you thing. put it out yeah. just to like stamp that time because so, I knew I was going to like start letting, you know, I'm going to start working and doing other stuff, not skating as much, so... Now it's there, but I feel like that's like my masterpiece or whatever. Yeah, it's like even though it's like whatever, you know what I mean? But it's a, it's a, it's like an album or a book. It like it, it sets the time and it's gonna be there forever. Yeah, you know, Mm -hmm. it's like always gonna be a part of history, whether you find it on a VHS or someone's computer. But like, I don't know. I thought about it in the end, you know, because you get this money, then you, and that's normally what you do. 
Mm -hmm. You know, when you ride for these brands, is you make a video part and then you're like, okay, that's done, and then you start all over from scratch. Yeah, you start all over yeah. again, which is insane. <laughs> and how many times can you do like <laughs> the same tricks almost like and just be like, hey, exactly, you know? exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, are, do you do you find art shows nerve wracking? Um, I mean, like when I make them myself. Yeah. No, I used to really enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And the last one was a little nerve-wracking because there was a lot of complications with my health, and I worked on it for three years. But in the end, like, the thing is, is, like, it's not nerve-wracking unless you have an expectation. Mm -hmm. And if you have an expectation, yeah. then it's nerve-wracking because then you have all these things in your brain if you think that it's supposed to get you whatever. It's money or mm -hmm. notoriety or press or reviews. So... Mm -hmm. Um, in the beginning, no, I did not find it nerve-wracking because I was getting to do what I wanted to do, which was the same as skating. When I got to skate, I just got to be in my own little world. Mm -hmm. So what exactly, and then now you're doing Club Rhubarb. I'm doing Club Rhubarb now. So what exactly is that? Club Rhubarb is a private club. It's a private art gallery that I run out of my apartment in Chinatown. And okay. it's, it's basically called a club because I want to filter out all those things that I did not like about mm -hmm. the art world where people don't just have the luxury to walk in mm -hmm. you know I'm showing artists that haven't had a platform they're kind of unknown but I believe in these artists as much as I believe in myself and the people that I want in front of the space I want them to be really experiencing the work and the space and realize that it's special mm -hmm. so a big part of it is like the the apartment has ambient light, mm -hmm. so there's no track lighting, and you get to see these works like more of in a natural setting. They have people take their shoes off and set them down and hang out. It's mm -hmm. not just about coming in and swirling around and saying I was there. It's like actually having people engage. Wow, how did you come up with that idea? Yeah. Is that, did that that came up because I had Lyme disease. Oh, yeah. Ooh. So I had my hands paralyzed for like a year where I couldn't really work, so I had to cancel my show with Marlboro the first time. And so then I was like, oh, I'm gonna do this art show out of my apartment. Mm -hmm. So what I did was I, once I started going and doing studio visits, I did like an autobiographical timeline uh, show of how I got into art, starting with Raymond Pettibone. Okay. And that was like the first person like art I got to see on albums that kind of inspired me and the, I'm the common denominator between these 65 people. Mm -hmm. So the show was called Digging for Diamonds in the Disco, which the title comes from this place called Passerby, which was Gavin Brown's club that he had, which was like a nightlife place of how like I kind of met a lot of the people was through socializing and nightlife because mm -hmm. I didn't go to school. So I did that show. That show got tons of press. Somehow we sold things. I went back, I made my exhibition. I was not content with the way my show went. Mm -hmm. So I just was, started focusing, like three months later, I did the first solo show, which was Reza Shafahi, and then after that, it just kind of all fell in place and took off. Wow. How can uh, one enter the club rhubarb? <laughs> you, <can't, yeah. laughs> you gotta be on the list. You gotta be on the list, Lee. You, like, you, like, you gotta be on the list. <laughs> You just got a message. It's not online. <laughs> it's not online. online. There's no. There's no web. There's no website. It's like there's a no, secret. There's no. Well, thing. there's an Instagram. There's an Instagram. You got to direct message me or email me. Yeah. You can okay. come. You can come to the club. Uh, will there be wine there? Free wine? Maybe. I don't know. No, maybe a cheese plate. Maybe it's. There might be like a, a falafel hummus plate. B y o b. Yeah. <laughs> and are you like changing? The artists are coming in and. How often are you changing? Like <laughs> I only do, I know, they stay, the exhibitions roll longer than a month. Mm -hmm. Like the, the show, but by the time Sal and Desi's show ends, it'll be there three months, but I only do two shows a year. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I try to find artists that have not been overexposed and it's new and that like is like fresh. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard to find, each show I try to make it like equal or top it. The last show before that was Joe Roberts and I didn't think we were going to be able to top it. But then I found Sal and Desi, which is amazing. And you were saying that it was the last show really took off. Like it, the it last show has really taken off yeah. in a positive way with lots of support. And it's hit different parts. I, I would say it's really kind of now hitting the real art world with this mm -hmm. one. Yeah. Nice. 
I don't feel good. Yeah, it feels. I mean, the the thing is, is this is not about me. This yeah. is about the artist, which is like the thing. But it does feel good, and mm -hmm. I'm glad that people are like showing love and supporting. But I'm very more than anything. I'm just happy for the artist. Yeah. Yeah. Th that was like your cover. Like here you go, boom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what? What now that that's? It's like your video part. Now that that's done, what are you gonna work on? You gotta work on your next video part. Well, there's <laughs> there's Reza, there's like a Reza Shafahi and Mamali Shafahi are next, and then that's it. That's the on. But then like for 2022, hopefully it's going to be all women. Mm -hmm. I'm not exactly sure yet. A lot of the people that I want to exhibit have had children, mm -hmm. so it's hard to be able to have them just focus on making art. Mm -hmm. But it all kind of like, it's just like skating. It's kind of like, I keep it, there a bit of spontaneity in it. So like when you go out, you don't know exactly what you're doing. Like mm -hmm. I know what I'm doing for the next one, but it took me a year. It took me a year to know I was doing for a year ahead. So I'm just going to keep treating it like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we'll see. That's cool. That is cool. Yeah. I got to come check it out. Yeah. You got to <laughs> come see it. That'd be interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How long are the, like, the events? Do you just, like, hang out all day or? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Sometimes <laughs> when I'm there, I'm waiting for appointments and people, but I'm usually only there a certain amount of days a week. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, it's not all the time. That's mm -hmm. true. You can't be inside all you the time. You ever, like, hide in the back room and just, like, kind of, like, look at everybody? No. Like, <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No. Not, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> 2020. Or, no, uh, 22. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to talk to you. Uh, do you still do yoga or, like? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, on, no, that's not true. That. Like, three weeks ago, I started trying to do it, but it's kind of, like, ADD yoga. Uh -huh. I was doing like, ADD <laughs> yeah, like for five minutes, I would yeah. do some stretches. And if anything, I do like, I, I don't talk. I mean, I don't meditate. I like, if anything, it's like more of a sleeping thing. Like yeah. I lay up, I lay on my back and like stare at the ceiling and yeah. breathe Yeah. for like 10 minutes. And then that's mm -hmm. it. I hear I, the breathing thing is really good. Just to learn to like certain breathing exercises. Mm -hmm. It is. I mean, that yeah. what is Hatha yoga, Hatha one yoga is mm -hmm. all about breathing and just like sitting. Well, I have a good, I mean, I don't know if you don't know this, but Tony's notorious for doing yoga at clubs. Oh, yeah? <laughs> no, I don't know that. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm like, like you're kinda, in a club. So yeah. in, with, in Barcelona, that was one of his signature moves. Oh, Everybody loved it. Cool. But it was interesting. I got a funny story. A couple of years ago, I'm at a Halloween party <laughs> oh, in downtown yeah. New York. And, like, you know, I'm chilling, like, doing her thing, having some drinks. <laughs> and then, like, it's, like, 3 in the morning or something. And through the fog, I see somebody doing a headstand <laughs> in the middle of the dance floor. And, and it's, like, I didn't, couldn't see your face. And I was, like, oh, there's Tony Cox. <laughs> <laughs> now you know it's a real party. Yeah, I was, yeah, like, that, that, there, that's Tony Cox. And I walked over. I and know. It's a, it's a, it's a um, <laughs> bofo party. Maybe it was just the type, the, 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 the grace <laughs> in the hands. <laughs> like, yeah, that's him. <laughs> oh, man. I remember. That's awesome. That. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hell yeah. So you haven't been doing that that much lately, huh? No, I have not been mm. doing the yoga club thing. <laughs> that's a trademark. That's a trademark one. You gotta. Yeah, man. Yeah. I'm uh, learning so much about <laughs> you, man. <laughs> <laughs> so cool. Yeah, for sure. Some great ideas. <laughs> who who all used to do was uh, Matt Field was really into it, right? Uh, Matt Field was really into it, but the first one that all really brought it to life was Mike Dare, and okay. then. And then I think Matt got it from Mike and then Quim, Joe mm -hmm. Quim, and Mike Cardona got into it, mm -hmm. and then the McGrath got into it, Barker was into it, I was into it, who else was into it? I don't know, it was like something that I did but didn't really understand but knew it was good for me, but would go to these sessions and just be like, what the hell am I doing? Yeah, yeah. I feel weird, be like three <laughs> people on some place in Lower Hate just being like, okay. But realizing like, the more I did it, the more it really did have an effect on me. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? I'm like, like breathe. Yeah, yeah. Because Lenny Kirk used body. to make fun of it. <laughs> oh, of course. Oh, Lenny. Yeah. <laughs> He'd be like, man. You're doing all this devil shit. And I'm like, okay. Devil. All right, Lenny. Yeah. <laughs> the Lenny story. Oh, Lenny Kirk. Yeah, so you know Lenny. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Praying to people and like. Yeah, he used to shop at our apartment. And oh, yeah. Yeah, he would. yeah, when I lived with Tobias one time, he came in with like some like four-year-old kid and some strange older man and 
I woke up and I was like, they're on acid or Tom and Rose are, I think on acid. And I was like, what is going on? <laughs> I was like, why is there like a four year old kid in our room? At, like three random, in the morning. Yeah. And they're like, Oh, we like random in the park. And then I was like, okay. Mm. Yeah. That's, that's too <laughs> yeah. Go. Yeah. And we're back to bed. <laughs> He's out now. Is he? Oh, yeah. He got out of jail. Yeah. Hope he's doing good, man. Yeah, last I mean, he was on Instagram all, a while ago, like all over the place. He was? Yeah. He's a legend. <laughs> Lenny's a um, legend. He's, he's amazing. But he's your prime example of skating. Someone that, like, moved to California when they're 14 and just, like, smoked so much weed and became a little altered mm-hmm. and got eaten Like a up. lot of the gangs mm-hmm. and just the stuff that's in the city. I mean, Hector, his alter persona from jail, you know, mm-hmm. was Hector. Did you see Dennis's book, the Lenny book? I have the book. Have you read all those notes? I don't and all think I read the notes yet. I'm yeah, bad. all those letters he was writing to, writing to Deer Dick and all that stuff. Like he had like a alter persona named Hector, I believe, and oh. it's like speaking in <laughs> Spanish and tongues. <laughs> <laughs> Poor guy. <laughs> no, seriously, he, he really got screwed up from skating and. Didn't like, he hit his head? Maybe I he, think? Did. he did. Hit his yeah, head. and yeah, I was hanging out with him and John things. McGrath at that time. He used to be at the pier a lot. Like mm-hmm. we, like the younger group would be like always be like, "Ooh," when he came around. But we'd always kind of like laugh a little bit because mm-hmm. he was he was goofy. He looked healthy to us, you know. But he was just kind of crazy, you know. Yeah. Uh, Ripper, <laughs> amazing. Ripper. He like changed the game. Like he Love switch him. dance. Like he like he. Oh yeah. So far ahead. Most mm-hmm. definitely. Let me let me ask you though. Uh, with the meditation inside the the uh, parties or whatever, like what kind of parties are they? Were they like chill like oh. parties, <laughs> no. or were they like no no boom, no, boom, no, boom, no, boom, no boom, like boom, no? It, it, like there <laughs> was like it was it was not like that. It was like my go to thing was to like flip upside down to I don't know why. To, I thought it was funny. No, yeah. it's funny. Yeah, yeah. You I thought it was funny. It's like a signature like, move. Yeah, yeah. and then <laughs> like you know, it led to other places. <laughs> Doing an inversion with that amount of stuff in your body always led <laughs> always led to not really mm. you know be like who do I have to call and apologize to I bet you can do a, ke- a keg stand though yeah, <laughs> yeah. I bet you can do a killer keg stand yeah. I don't know I never <laughs> no these were like proper clubs like with a, like three hundreds of people okay like, okay dancing, like, <laughs> In the middle of Barcelona. Because I feel like also like because I I kind of got ADD too. So like jazz and certain stuff that's like doom doom doom. It's like it makes me calm. Yeah, you know what was, I mean. It doesn't make me want to like thing. Turn jazz up. music for so, New York. So yeah, I was thinking that was probably like your like the music was like a certain way where it was like I'm gonna b- meditate now. Mm. You know. No, it wasn't like I was gonna meditate. It was just like a. You're like let me set it off real quick. Let me like, show, I'm, show them what I can do. I'm bored and entertaining <laughs> entertaining people. <laughs> that's good. Hey, oh man, it happened. So what what do you got planned for this summer then? What are you gonna do? What's Tony Cox up to? Not much. Go to the beach. Go to Long Island for a week, and then just after this exhibition, just like kind of have time for myself and mm-hmm. decompress. Okay. I want to go to Spain, but I kind of feel like it's not the time to quite travel yet until all these tests and things are mm-hmm. done with. I mean, it's not. It's pretty easy. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah? You said you had four tests in, like, that two weeks. Was, that was only because I'm an idiot, and I try to do too much, and I was like, oh, I'm going to go to Sweden, too. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I really want to go to Barcelona and go visit my friend in Italy, but mm. I'm just going to stay put in, in New York, upstate. Sometimes I need to learn how to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Just I mean, I really want to yeah, get out of here. You're a jet setter, for sure. I've always been like that. Yeah, yeah. that's good, though. It's good. I was, too, but then after, like, the, I started having, like, the art practice thing, it just, like, I had to, the things took so long to make, it just was in one place. So mm. that's the other thing was this year. I, I might go to Puerto Rico because mm. my friend. That's where I'm going tonight. Oh, you are? <laughs> yeah. yeah you my are. friend Chris <laughs> has a gallery there, and then Desi Santiago, one of the artists, the other artists in the show, he's going to have a show down there, so I want to go check it out. I want to okay. check out the space, and I've never been there. So no. probably go to Puerto Rico and then just, like, chill in New York. Have you seen B.A. lately? Have not seen Brian. I've talked to him, but have not. he's, like, living in Jersey, right? Asbury he lives Park, out right? in Jersey, a little past Asbury, I mm-hmm. think, but I have not seen him for a minute. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, every time I see him, he's like, come down to Asbury. Come yeah. hang out. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, but never. How far is it out there? Like an hour far. or so. An hour? Yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah, it's not that far. Um, do you keep it, do you like pay attention to skateboarding at all these days? Not really. Yeah. I mean, like, I don't, I don't, I don't look at magazines. I mean, I look at Instagram. I like, I follow certain skaters, but um, not really. I haven't seen, like, Joe Roberts, one of the other artists that shows at the apartment. He 
still really love skating and then leo really loves skating so they send me stuff but i don't really i mean i don't really pay attention i don't know if you're aware of the level of skateboarding oh i am i do see that i do see that stuff on instagram and then (laughs) i'm just like i mean that's where video games really played into the (laughs) mindset of kids where you're like it's you're like wow you manifested the video game yeah 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 totally when you look back on skateboarding, it's like, and your whole career, like, what do you feel the most proud of, like, everything? I feel that? most proud of, like, the people I met and the mm. community that I met that still has my back that mm. I have not seen in 22 years or two yeah. years. Mm-hmm. And um, you mean that's, like, an accomplishment or just in general? Just in general. I think the friendships mm-hmm. and, and, the ch- and, and the travel, the experience I had through the travel and traveling to other countries and being in the unknown with people that I love and growing these bonds with these people on these trips, that's what I truly appreciate mm-hmm. and am proud of. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool, man. I mean, you know, I go back and forth with it. I'm like, sometimes I'm like, did I waste a bunch of time? And then, I have and then regret, other times I, I'm I, like... Yeah, I, <laughs> I do, like, I look back and, like, when people send videos of things that I remember or post old stuff... I do kind of regret not trying harder to document, but then I'm like, whatever. There's, there, there was the things I did, and that was it. And that was my choice. I obviously did that for a reason because I was interested in other things and hanging out with other people, just besides skaters, you know, mm, for yeah. a big part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Who do you keep in touch with the most? From the, do you see Kenny around? Kenny, he lives I, upstate, right? No, he moved. He like was coach for like some country for like the. Uh, olympic team but he is living he was living in austin but they're about to move to santa rosa i keep in touch the most with kenny Mm -hmm. and um brian anderson who else then through instagram i mean i saw jerry sue but we i haven't seen him for like years but he came to see the show at the apartment tino razo Mm -hmm. who else um john minor a little bit just like people through direct messaging but not that many people yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people kind of just went their own ways. Yeah, no, totally. That's a, I find it interesting, you know, it's because you have this community and then, you know, it all kind of dissipates. And it's, yeah. And it's beautiful. It's kind of beautiful and it's kind of sad at the same time. Yeah. And you're like, it's a little bit, it, I guess that's what nostalgia is, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's why I want to go back to Spain. I want to see... You know, I just saw Quentin, but I, like I spent a lot of time. I, I still talk to Quentin and, and Javier Mendezawa, but I want to go back there because I really feel like I mean, I have my New York family, but I really f- have a strong family there. Yeah, still, as, as you do too. That's and why it, I go back there, and I'm like, I love these people. Totally, yeah. and I love that place because it's still so fresh and just non jaded. You mm-hmm. know. Yeah, true that. True that. that was good. I need to go, man. <laughs> yeah. I always say I do. I, I need to go. Yeah. I still, honestly, there's a whole bunch of places where it doesn't stand out as much to me to visit overseas because I don't really visit that much place, that many places. But Barcelona is that place that I'm like, I still need to go there. I still mm. need to skate that spot or at least go to that spot. You know, you I'd should just go experience it and see it. Yeah. You know, no, a lot of true. that stuff's still there. I don't know how much of it got skate proofed, but just don't get stuck there. For six no, yeah, you're right. right. For six How years. long were you yeah. stuck there? How long did you get uh, stuck there? I think I was there for like six years in total. Well, it's, you know, we well, did when the did the Santa there. Cruz end? And Santa then, Cruz ended in like 2008. And then you came back when? 2011. Wow. But I left for Damn. one year. I went to LA. And then I had the whole, I did, did the FTC thing and all that okay. stuff. It was like trying to make a life there. But yeah. It didn't really work out. But that's I mean, I knew like what I wanted to do is I had to kind of come back to here. Yeah. Yeah. As like as much as I didn't want to, I I knew I did. But it's great though. No, it is. It's probably the best decision we both made. I wouldn't be sitting in this chair. <laughs> I would probably be dead. You'd <laughs> 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 be filming tricks at Magba right yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, shit, man. I mean, what we got like two minutes left. Okay. What, how are we gonna fill this time? I don't know. We maybe have Freestyle. to do a headstand on the table. No. Nope. <laughs> oh, let's do the head. Let's do the headstand. <laughs> we'll move the table. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I need the bathroom. <laughs> how long that's been going on for? For like five, <laughs> ten minutes, uh, fifteen okay. minutes. All right, yeah. that's not so bad. <laughs> <laughs> When's the last time you went to SF? Um, I went in like 2019 November. Yeah. My friend Sahar. 
was having a show at the MoMA. So she flew me out there to go see her show. Wow. How did yeah. it feel to be there? It was amazing. It was the first time I re, like, fell in love with it again. Mm -hmm. Like, cause Joe, Joe and Megan moved, well now they moved again, but they were living in Upper Hay by the Panhandle. And mm -hmm. like for once I like, you know, like I know this sounds weird, but when people used to film footage and you knew it was Northern California by the color blue, it yeah. was cause that sky. It oh, had the damn. smell and the color of the sky, like by the panhandle, and I was like, I could live here again if I was rich. If I was rich, <laughs> <laughs> if I was rich. A couple more art shows, even. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. You got You can make your way in there. Those were, there's, there's a way. I mean, I, I, I loved if it. But for to. years, I kind of blocked all that out, yeah. like that all that happened, you know. But then I went back and was like, realized how much that place was is and made made a part of me mm -hmm. totally the buffalo exchange <laughs> oh, snap. Did you ever work shout there? out to buffalo exchange yeah, well, for keeping skaters uh, that was the place keeping, that keeping skater skaters alive for burritos for i would Kelly. wait until uh, a skater came out of it after selling everything and i would see what they what they sold uh -huh. I would uh -huh. like, Yo, what they, you know like no. when i was we were younger yeah. you know we used to go to like Co copeland's and totally ross well uh <laughs> I guess we got to wrap it up. They're right. they're queuing us, but oh, yeah. all right. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Lee. That wasn't too painful, was no, it? No, not at all. I love you, man. I love you too. <laughs> <laughs> Good shit.